our guest tonight is Stephen Strong. He is a progressive archaeo historian. He's usually part of a team with his son, Evan, and they're also current columnists inside the Oddities eClub magazine, of course. Stephen is a secondary school teacher with a background in archaeology and education. He was involved in the formation of a graduate diploma of Aboriginal education for the New South Wales Department of Education and writing units on traditional law and contemporary history. Um, Evan has uh, also has a background in anthropology and Indigenous culture studies and counselling and med mediation with a bachelor's degree in social sciences and graduate studies in psychology. Wow, that's, uh, that's a lot, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> they, yeah, they have both spent many years learning, living and or working with, and here we go, my pronunciation, let's see if I get it, I, I, do, I don't crucify it this week, um, with the Bunjung, Bunjalung Language Confederation, that's the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, the Ramingeri, which is South Australia, and the Gamil, Gamilaroi peoples, which is the Northern New South Wales. Stephen, did I butcher that? Stephen, uh, well, there? actually, that was, yeah, that was pretty good. Oh, um, good. Bunjalung's <laughs> a bit tricky. The other two, you did well on. That was oh, good. That that's good to know. So, and you, 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 and your son also operate under the doctrine of Wirichin, black fella, white fella, dreaming in remembrance of Carno W, a spokesperson for the Ramingeri. Is that right, Ramingeri? That's definitely the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent. Hey, look, it's great that you've come back to us. Um, as I said in emails, um, this is actually Sheila and my last show together. Um, after. My, I've been on air three years, which I couldn't believe it when I worked that out the other day, Sheila. But you've been on air six six years, is it? Um, at least five. I can't remember exactly when I started. Around two thousand and twelve, I think. Wow! And for people wondering what we're going to do next, both Sheila and I, um, I've already set up my. Um, we're we're going into the brave new world of podcasting. So, and um, mine went live on Apple iTunes yesterday. So, um, I'll send some links in the chat a little bit later. And Sheila, your your podcast will be up next week. Is that not the case? Um, yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> now you put me on the spot, haven't you? But yes, I'm working on it. Well, that's good to see. So, Stephen, you, it's quite um, it's nice to go out with Stephen on the last one, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Fascinating information. And I was talking about you to a um, friend of mine in Sydney, so I've been sharing some of your um, work with him. So nice to be able to do that. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. It's a pleasure. Certainly. Now, if anyone out there would like to see Stephen and Evan in person, and they're in Australia... Um, they will be presenting at three places this year. Uh, the first is at, or oh, probably many more actually, but the three I have here. The first one is at the Star Family Conference in Rye, Victoria on February the 22nd and the 24th. They will also be doing a three-hour workshop and a two-hour presentation on March the 2nd at the Chugan Progress Association Hall on the Gold Coast between 3 and 6 p.m., and a two-hour presentation Easter Saturday in Mullaney. Um, is that with Nexus and Duncan Rhodes? Um, that... it, it is, but um, I think that's going to be in probably in May, I think, now. We just had a phone call from Duncan yeah. today and we spoke about it two hours ago. We're going to put it back to about May. It's still going on. Yes. And it'll still be at Mullaney, but it's just a bit further backwards in time. Uh, that's probably a good idea because a lot of people do go away for that period of time don't they then make the most out of it so um good idea i might come up to that one if that's the case because i had plans but now now if it's being moved i will come to that one so right. yes you, so you can get out to see Stephen and evan in person just go to their website for any updates if you can't make any of those events um and you go to www.forgottenorigin.com okay and i'll also put the links in the chat room before we um finish today so, and it sounds like we have Evan and Stephen this time. So, lovely to have you, Evan. Yep, I, I'm definitely here. <laughs> Welcome, Evan. I don't oh, think you've met Sheila. 
particular is yet Evan. So, um, yeah. but um, I know that uh, after our last interview, Sheila's very keen to do a little bit more on the ancient culture side. So you may be getting a further call <laughs> down the track. Right. Excellent. Awesome. Always happy to talk. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so let's get to it. So um, for those that didn't listen to our first show, it is up on the on YouTube. You can go and check out the first two hours of questioning. Um, hopefully it wasn't too much like an interrogation last time. I was just fascinated with everything that Stephen has to say. I've been following Stephen for quite a few years. Um, first time I heard him speak was at a Nexus conference, which I think we worked out was about five years ago, maybe six. And... Um, mm -hmm. You know, since then, I've just kept in touch with what, what the guys have been doing. And every year, they just seem to be getting into more trouble, really, don't you, you two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of that, yeah. Recent trouble. <laughs> yeah, lots of trouble with the government, with everybody. Yeah, no, we make lots of enemies and a few friends along the way. But we certainly do make some enemies in high places, yeah. At, at least you can dig yourself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so far so good <laughs> yeah, we've been doing a lot of digging recently yeah but yeah we still mean we do we, we know what the government's going to do we sort of know in advance what they're hamstrung by their rules so we know how to play around it and they don't they they threaten us a lot and they've told us they're going to put us in jail three times in the last two years and it never comes to anything so it's okay it's just a game yeah, it's it's it is a lot of talk, isn't it? I find that with the magazine, some of the stories I run, I have um I have a little white vehicle that whenever I'm I always know I've been like I've put out something that I shouldn't have when I get a bit of surveillance happening at the front of the road. Um mm. and then have you have you had any of that kind of harassment where you, you walk up to a vehicle and it takes off suddenly? Uh, no, because we live out in the country here, we're all out in the country, so it's a bit harder because they parked out the front of our place, we wouldn't know they were there. <laughs> so it's a different setup. But um, look, we know that we've got a personal ASIO agent, I know his name and I know where he lives, and we know that our phones are bugged, and it, it really doesn't mean a thing to us. I mean, we just do what we're going to do anyway. They yeah. know what they're doing, and to be honest, nearly everything we're dealing with, it's not a secret. The government knows most of this stuff anyway. They've been trying to keep it a secret, but there's no secrets there. And uh, they just, they do their best to play the game as they play it. But they're still hamstrung in Australia by the fact that there's still some degree of allegiance to the law of the land. So therefore, they've got to play within certain rules. But they certainly know how to keep things interesting. Yes, yes. No, I thoroughly agree. As I said, over the years, I've had a couple of interesting moments. And... Um, I've just learnt to take lots of photographs and to document and um, and basically uh, change computers quite regularly. I've I've had a series. Of, uh, I've I've gone. You would not believe how much electronical equipment I go through. Um, and also, I I I do a lot of. That's one of the reasons I'm off radio and I'm going into podcasting too. It will give me that flexibility where I can uh, do a podcast anywhere, at any time, and any place. Hey, Sheila. That's right, Sharon. Sorry, I'd um, you tuned out. Muted my mic. <laughs> no, I'd muted my mic, and I had to. I've got two computers running. I had to work out which mouse it was because <laughs> okay. the, the main one doesn't work without a mouse. Um, Sheila and, and I over the years we we found a certain subjects that when we discuss them, we seem to have lots of storm trouble, don't we, Sheila? <laughs> we we do, and all sorts of funny things happen. And again, like you and um, Stephen and Evan, I'm very familiar with the. The surveillance and the um, the cars and the helicopters and so on. So it's all good fun. And You're not alone. <laughs> no. Oh, we have some great <laughs> helicopter stories. Oh yes, we get black helicopters as well. It's um, it really depends what you're touching on. I I I find that the most interesting thing trying to work out what I've done because um, a lot of the time I've got three or four interviews going or, or articles happening. So I never know which one's the, the hot potato. And um, <laughs> you don't get hot. <laughs> which, which one? Well, you always no, need to hold like a, a multiple choice card, like point at which one. <laughs> it is. It, it, can, it can get a little bit that way. Um, I've, I've learned there's certain subjects I don't go anywhere near. One of them is the Clintons. Um, that one was very scary. So I've actually pulled articles on them. Um, I, you, 
a lot of people wouldn't think that the US has reach over here, but they really do. And people should be more aware of that, I think. Anyway, let's get to better stuff and more um, something that will broaden our knowledge, which is, of course, the ancient culture and sites within Australia. So let's kick off with um, Stephen. I um, I believe you have inspected what is thought to be the oldest astronomical construction at Wordy Yuang. Did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> Wordy yeah, Yuang. Right. Do you think yeah. this ancient sundial, that's what I saw it being, was how the Aboriginal or the original people divided the seasons? Um, well, what was your take? Mm. Yeah, look, it just certainly does, and there's no denying that the CSIRO are giving a date of somewhere between ten to 20,000 years wow. when it marked out the summer and lunar equinox. So that part is definitely right. But to then think that does it mark out the seasons, well, you've got to remember the original people don't think uh, with time as the defining concept of what makes their day and what makes their year. So the season will be more a matter of the fact that a certain fruit turns up a certain time of the year always, and that'll mark out a season, or it might be the oncoming of the rain season. Black cockatoos. Black cockatoos coming up in the up in the wet there. There are six seasons, aren't there? Six, yes. Yeah, so it varies from place to place. I think what it does mark what it out. Does mark out. Okay, that one. Sorry, I missed Sorry. that. Oh, we didn't speak. So we, we I'm just, I was actually just writing down how there's six seasons. Is that six wet seasons or six seasons? Well, over no, six throughout the year. There's there's one that's the beginning of the wet season before it starts and the first noises that come with it. Then you go into another part of that season. So there might be six within the year. Then if you go into other parts of Australia, because it's such a diverse place, there'll be a different things that mark out their season. So... It's pretty dangerous to say the word original and then sort of think that all of us work the same way because there's 500 different languages mm -hmm. and our seasons will depend on markers within the land. And when something is shown, it won't be, oh, God, get the calendar out today, lads. I think it's the 1st of uh, May. It must be a new season. They wouldn't do it like that. It would be when they saw something happening in the land that gave them a period that another part of the land is now changing in some way, that's a season. Okay. That's probably a very sensible way of doing it, isn't it? I mean, I don't know about you, but um, I don't – I remember growing up in Australia when I was about 13 and at 5 o'clock you could set your watch to it that it would, after a really hot day in summer, it would um, rain down right at, right at 5 o'clock every day. But I've realised yeah. um, – that was when I was 13 – now, like we're talking a few a few years later, not too many years later, but a few, and now I, you never see that anymore, or it's it's uh, it's something has really changed. I think, whereas when a you lot, when you a lot's yeah. changed, yeah, yeah, and it used to be the seasons were predictable because nobody was destroying the weather patterns and polluting mm. the earth, so therefore everything came the same way, and that mm. predictability made the season. We knew exactly what was going to be, what sort of food was going to be in a certain time of the year. And another time near what other food was there. So you could basically plan your diet and your lifestyle according to the seasons and everyone worked together. And then when you ruin the seasons, which is what we do now, well, then that link stops. I think the word of Yuang has got, I've sat down with the elders and they've made me, Uncle Reg made me lay on the ground and then look at other rocks that it was pointing towards. It has a lot of different meanings. At a superficial level, yes, some say the, the uh, measurement for pi is found on that stone arrangement. And really? the sun alignments, yeah, that's true. What mm. else is there, it has other functions too in relation to what takes place above in the sky and the placement of those rocks. So it's got many other levels as well as. But, yes, definitely it is an important marker and it is the oldest astronomical marker of the sun, the movement of the sun and the moon in the world. Mm. That alone is important. But, you know, if, if I mentioned that to somebody in the States, they'd have no idea about it. It's just criminal, really, isn't it? Absolutely no, no idea. Well, mm. you can mention that to nearly anyone in Australia, and guess what? They'd have yeah. no idea about it. It's criminal, really. Yeah, it is, both it ways, is. always. That's yeah, what it we're is. trying to fix up. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, and you, you're doing a good job. 
that you are. Okay. Um, so Evan, would you mind telling us a little bit about the Snowy Mountain Astronomical Walls and what do you think their actual purpose is? Well, um, I think you're all, you were kind of debating this in one of your presentations. I was hoping you might have actually decided on something by now. <laughs> it's been a while. Oh, well, um, with the Snowy Mountains, I mean, yeah, they're quite interesting because they go right down cliffs and then into the lake. So, yeah, you know, the, the, a bunch of white kind of settlers went there and did it doesn't really make sense. Yeah. A lot of work went into it. But I know one of the elders we're talking to mentioned it, didn't he? Angel John Gallard, the senior park ranger, said that they actually looked at the wall, you yeah. know, the wall, one of the yeah, lake yeah, 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 that one. And they found that wall marked out the alignment. They got an astronomer That's right. um, up there and they found the wall marked out the alignment of five planets. When the five major planets aligned, that wall was at a perfect alignment of when that took place. And that particular wall would have, what, 15, 20,000 rocks we could see? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and it was one of those ones was stacked quite well, you know. like But well not balanced. stacked like Europeans. No, Remember, the structure was yep. different. Yep. Europeans have big rocks on both sides and they ram them with little rocks. This was done differently yep. and it wasn't like done like Europeans. And why any European would decide to make a wall go down the side of nothing it's just a mountain it's a small hill rather and mm. spend twenty thousand rocks to put them there for no reason is beyond belief it didn't happen that way yes then we saw the other one didn't we have the big one? Oh yes that's right that's about fifty thousand rocks isn't it that's yeah. steep yes mm. that's right down the cliff so yeah well, oh, we the... couldn't walk down all of it, could we? No. No, uh -huh. we couldn't. It was too steep to walk down, but they were building these rocks. They were all in the same alignment running down there, and they came up the other side of a waterfall, and that one, nobody knows, do they? Yeah, no, that one's like, uh, can I answer that one? But, um, uh, yeah, one of one of our other elders talked, I'm sure he talked about that, and that, that people used to run on top of them. Oh, yes. Uncle Marbuck, Uncle yeah. Uncle Marbuck talked oh, about God, how they yeah. used um that as a like a dreaming path yeah the story is it's an original story from an elder we never question at a certain time maybe once every 200 years a series of sacred sites align with one another and they lead to that wall and he told us what would take place is that the uh clever fellas and clever women would bound between these portals and they'd run down the whole coast of australia and go from one to another and then what they did is they would run up that wall, wouldn't they, Evan? That's right. And that would happen when the five planets aligned mm. and they said what the men were singing and the women had something else when they ran up, didn't That's they? That's right. And what happens when they got to the top of the wall, we were told by our elders they then just went into a portal and they went up. Without the use of any ship, they could do it just through these portals that opened up and apparently they happened when the five planets aligned. So that is the long and short of that story, isn't yeah, it? There's the two halves, which we've learned years apart, mind yeah, you. Yeah, we've got them years apart, but yeah, that's how they go together. But the other one, we, nobody knows, um, it's massive, and to build it, you would need top class engineers and labourers to even be silly enough to stand on those slopes and not die. Mm. But somehow they build them, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's my next question. I mean, it sounds like, was were the were the rocks laid kind of like you see in Peru where they're all at different angles but they fit perfectly together? Or is it is it like a loose rock that's just been rammed into position? Well, no, no it's between those two, to be honest. I, I wouldn't put it – we've seen rocks that are of the South American level at other sites, no denying that. That's mm -hmm. easy. And there is a different – of these those ones you couldn't put papers – a piece of paper between the joints but these ones no but what you will find is you'll find a huge rock then a couple of small rocks and a medium rock and then another rock of a different size and they're all stacked carefully together but not not at that level there but they're they're there to make a wall they weren't there to make a structure as such other sites we've seen are different this had the function of marking out a wall that took place my understanding is, I don't know, once 189 years or something, the five planets align, and that seems to be a time, according to Uncle Marbuck, when all of the ley lines open up and then the elders can sing the songs and then basically dance down the, 
the east coast of Australia and then off into the portal. God knows what happens after that because we didn't get that part no, of the story, we, did we? No, we just that's all we got. We yeah, didn't get the return journey. Journey. I wanted to ask, so how do you get back home, Uncle Mark? Yeah. But we didn't. Get that. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to ask elders questions. It's a stupid oh, risk because oh, what well, happens is, what do they do, Evan? They answer your question with another question, which you can't answer at all. Yeah, yeah. right. And, and even if it is, and that's still in a circular yeah. long arc that may take 25 minutes. <laughs> and then yeah somewhere in there is uh different levels of um information but 90 percent of the time we don't you know it, no, it's, so it's we didn't harder. ask but anyway that's the yeah. story with it as original story mm -hmm. is it's actually the lead on to a portal the white fella story is that it's actually a um a start much marker and so this is the problem with all these sites they're mm -hmm. multi-level they'll have a spiritual level and they'll have a pragmatic level and the archaeologists dismiss the spiritual straight away and look for the pragmatic. So when they do these sites, they always do an injustice because the sites always have a spiritual component within them. Sometimes it's the major part. And it's often got an upstairs level. Yeah. I mean, it, it usually does, doesn't it? It always yeah. links to something upstairs too. So there's a lot, lot of different levels to these sites. And that one is obviously very much an as on top, so below site. It's got a lot to do with as on top. So the, the men singing would be the vibration and yep. the alignment with and the ley lines all in alignment would yep. open the portals. Um, so we've we've heard that we've heard similar stories around mm. places like Hanging Rock, you know, where the girls disappeared, um, the schoolgirls, yeah. and apparently yeah. that you know they, there were portals there and um, they were there on a particular day. Uh, mm. And the vibrations slipped in and never, never came back. Yeah, they slipped over. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same thing now. It's they're still around. The portals are opening and tearing, and the fabrics tearing everywhere. But yeah, that's part of the deal. There was always portals here, and there was always sacred sites. The original people lived on these sites and knew the lines. And this is what we're talking about. So these these rock arrangements, when, because they're running on straight lines, I know they're running directly on top of power lines, ley lines. Mm. And the archaeologist who goes and sees it sees the rocks. We ask why are the rocks there and what function are they performing and what's of greater purpose behind it. And that's more important. Yes, it certainly is. And that's that's what I want to know. So it's it's mm. it must be frustrating for you too if if you if to actually want to know all of this knowledge and you're so cl you're closer than most people are to it, but you're still not getting it, are you? It's um it must it must be very frustrating. I would <laughs> I would find it annoying. But. Well, it is, and I can't go into detail, and Evan knows we can't right now, but it, it would seem like um, after close to 10 years of banging ahead against a brick wall, I think the wall's falling over, but I can't go into details about that. It does seem like a few things have tripped over, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe those people who've been blocking this might be just about at the stage where they're going to become cooperative. So, yes, you're right. It is frustration frustrating but i've found and we might be right in this case might we Evan? maybe that if we keep persevering with the truth and we keep using science all the time and we play their games eventually they've got to listen mm. and that may be the case but anyway that's in the future and we'll see how that runs together but it's looking promising yes that's one of the places i'm i definitely have on my my must-do list to visit now so now, back in 2013, you were sent a location to investigate by Kraus Donor, which um, turned out to be part of a massive complex of historical finds, perhaps even a township or gathering location for an early civilization. Would you share with our listeners your findings and revelations of the ancient underground New South Wales tunnel entrance? Is that what you still call, oh, yeah. refer to it as? or? Yeah, well, we actually call it Klaus's Walls because... Um, ah, okay, that sounds uh, better. The reason we call it that is because nobody would ever find the damn thing if you didn't have the map that he sent us on oh, where okay. it is. How did he get, um, how did he would, get the knowledge for it? Was, oh, was, we, we can't say that. That's Klaus's part of the deal. Oh. But he got <laughs> this map, and what it does is it locates... Well, it locates different readouts, and one of them was he said, this is a place where there's a massive cave that leads to a cavern, and you go there. It's probably, in fact, in my vote, as far as I'm concerned, it's the most dangerous site I've been to. It's the one I least enjoy going to. Oh, okay. I know when we took 
Graham mm -hmm. Hancock there at Santa. Santa was in intensive care the next day, wasn't she, Evan? Yeah. Um, it is so dangerous to get to, and nobody could find it. I mean, we could because we've been there a few times. Mm. But, yeah, and it's on the side of an extremely steep slope. It's so steep that if you were to misplace your feet, you will fall about 100 metres and you will die. There's mm -hmm. nothing to stop you falling down. But you, what I, I am saying that is this, sorry? I was, I was wondering if you'd thought about using a drone in places like that. Like some drone. No, footage. you couldn't get a drone in there. Oh God, no, no, it's too narrow. Yeah. And plus, you wouldn't. Well, you've got to get in there. So we have to go ourselves, unfortunately. As mm. much as I hate going there, I've been there four times and I've never enjoyed it. Never will. I, I lost a the toenail there. That's right, you did too. Oh, yeah. To my knowledge, toenail is still there. There's probably still is, mate. It'll be a relic, and I'll find it in the future and try and work out what the hell did this mean. It was my big toe as well. That, that's true too. <laughs> Well, look, here's the trick with it, guys. The reason why it's so amazing is there are three walls inside there. Now, the three walls are perfectly straight and they hold up a sandstone shelf above it that would weigh 150 tonnes, and those three actually sit underneath it. Now, two of these walls are identically the same height, which I think is 151 centimetres. The other one is slightly taller because it's further down, but the three of them are parallel to each other. And then what you've got underneath this shelf are rocks, the rocks are sandstone rocks, each one of them would weigh about three or four ton and they've been cut and shaped and stacked on top of one another in rows of four and you could not put a piece of paper between the joints and they've been cut and you can even see the mortar. They are perfectly joined. You would swear you were standing in South America because of the craftsmanship and the fact, as I said, is you cannot put a cigarette paper between them. These are our three rows together. Now, what we knew was past that, there was a shaft. That was the first time we're there. It's collapsed, hasn't it, ever since then? Uh, yeah, I'd say it'd be pretty collapsy. At yeah. Time. Now, I went how far down? I went down because I'm the scrawniest there by a fair bit. So I got sent to keep walking in past where the three walls are because those walls lead down the cavern. And I got down about, what, 15 metres? Yeah. And... I just couldn't go any further because it was collapsed past that point. I, I um, went outside mm. and there was a massive crack along the roof and the side. And you could see the cavern. I could see the cavern. I yeah. could feel this fresh air blowing in my face. But, but we couldn't well, get We're in. looking at maybe, what do you reckon that would be? Five centimetres. Yeah. Well, five yeah. to ten centimetre yeah, crack, crack. And it was like, it almost like it was split perfectly inside. Yeah. But, I mean, mm -hmm. There's no way any of us are squeezing we into that hole. And I can also say we went back on another occasion. I'm going to have to be deliberately cryptic about this mm -hmm. because we found there was another entrance. Cool. Didn't we, Evan? Yeah. And uh, we stopped. <laughs> we went down a way and we stopped. We thought, oh, no, no, we're not going any further. We pulled up on that one. And that told us. That, yeah, there was another entrance, but that was a trick entrance, and there was something way wrong as we got down there, which we won't go into now. So that was another part of that same. It looked to me like well, you've got to remember we've got we're going back for the if the Egyptians, if this is who it is, we're going back four thousand six hundred years. It looks to me like this was just some sort of crypt of some form. It was buried. Somebody was buried there because it's an opening. The three walls lead into that cavern and run down that particular shaft for at least, well, I got 15, but I had another 15 to go to get to the cavern, and the cavern we can't get into, and no one will know where it is, so I don't mind telling people about it because they could walk around Gosford for the rest of their life. And and people have looked for it. Oh, God, they yeah. Oh, they find can't it. find it. We're, we're cool about that. You have <laughs> to know where it is. And the interesting part is that, Klaus, from that, we went to three other sites that he told us and he gave us on this map and every one of them had a different form of something unusual that was taking place there. Mm -hmm. Two were civilizations and one was quarter acre, a complete quarter acre block. And I remember walking on it and all it was was dead vegetation. It was meter upon meter of dead trees, dead bush, dead everything. And all around it, it was like someone scythed it out. You can see all these trees growing really well. And inside that area, nothing was growing and it was dead. And he had a big marker on that one and he wasn't sure what it was, but he thought it was some sort of machine or something. Whatever it was, 
had poisoned at least a quarter acre in nearly a perfect square. And I thought, well, never seen that in the bush before. So, no. yeah, there is something there and it's ancient, but we don't know what it is. And as I said, we thank Klaus for that because he's the one who gave us the map. Problem is there were about 120 different sites on there and so far we've done four. Oh, oh my gosh. Sounds We're like a bit you short need to... on that one. There's a bit more to be done yet, ladies and gentlemen. But we have scored four out of four. So I've got to tell you, Klaus, your batting yeah. average is pretty good, but it's pretty hard. The problem is it doesn't give us depth. It just says there's something there. And sometimes it's tap five meters under the surface. Sometimes it's 50 meters under the surface. So it's tricky. So it would be wonderful to find out where he got it. Obviously, it's some type of map. It would be wonderful to discover how how exactly he had got that, if it was some ancient um, scroll or something. Um, got to ask him, I think. That's the trick. You've got to ask Klaus. He's a lovely man. We know him well. We've known him for years. Mm -hmm. um, and he's very open with his work. But I can tell you, this stuff he's got, and I'm not, I know a bit more about it, but I'm allowed to say, it works. It works. We, we, we've got something every time. I mean, Pat, remember the Cave of the Orbs, Evan? Uh, yeah, yeah so we're still was... dealing with that. So, no, yeah. believe me, ladies and gentlemen, whatever he's got, I don't know how it works, but we just go, this bush, there's no tracks, nothing there. There's nothing there. And we find something. What about the lobster one, Evan? Yeah. There's no, we got stuff. weird stuff each time from him. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but you'd have <laughs> to ask him about that. <laughs> so, um, okay, well, we won't talk any more about Klaus's walls until um, <laughs> you have something more to deliver, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. So um, what can you tell tell uh, me about the fabled Lumerian civilization, or was that the same place? Um, so apparently yeah, you, yeah. you came across something Somebody that's called Lumer Lumer yeah. Lumerian. Is that it? Lumerian or yeah. Lemurian? I think it is, but the original people call it Mu here. Yeah? The, the original people referred to this place as Mu. Mm -hmm. they, they believe this is the remnants of that civilization that was in the Pacific and fell apart, and there's bits of Easter Island and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And this was the part where they maintained that tradition. And that's why when the original people came here after a while, they didn't follow the, the, the role of Atlantis and took that role. So this is supposed to be, that's our understanding. That's what we've worked out from what the elders have told us. And they've never specifically sat down and said, Today we're going to talk about Lemuria and its relationship to Australia. It's always been cryptic. Mm. But, yes, they believe there are two ways we've lived through the whole of humanity, which goes much further than people think, even those of us that know there's been four civilizations. Two ways of living. One is in tune with the, uh, the, the earth and the rhythm of the earth, which is Lemurian, an original way. And the Atlantean way, which is to compete against nature and try and see if we can defeat nature for some stupid reason, which I've never worked out. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what humanity's history is about, about which of those two styles of um, living has been in the dominance. Obviously, the last 6,000 years, it's obviously been one form and it's not Lemurian, no. but they are the keepers of that way and that's why we keep, and the wisdom of that is in this country. It's like the bastions of how humanity lived when they were spiritual. And it's sort of about the fact the original people were, as it said before the cook came, that each original person was born with magic. Their job is to find their magic. So magic is like you're born with a lung, you're born with a heart, and you're born with magic. Everyone believes that. So that becomes a central point of the way people lived when they're in contact with their true self. That's the Lemurian original way. Yeah, but we don't live that way anymore. Um, we're saying we should, but that's what we don't do. So, yes, that's what this is all about. Because original history is not in a linear form, it's circular. So things go round and they come round. And it's time so, for the original race to come back again. So are you talking, when you use... Uh what what I think you're talking about is what I know as the root races. Is is that yeah. the same thing? Like yeah. I've been told that we're the sixth root race and we keep on screwing things up basically because we're not <laughs> in nature. And each, each time we get ourselves to a point where we nuke ourselves or something awful happens or we have a flood exactly. or some, some major uh, catastrophe yeah. happens and we're prone back to 
you know, the cave days basically. And um, we're at that point again where, yeah. you know, we haven't, exactly we've kind of so. gone against nature. Hmm. Yep. That's what the elders are saying too. That's exactly what they're saying. And that's what this is all about. It's not about archaeology. It's about things to prove what we're saying about what's about to happen. has happened because it's happened before. Mm. And that's why we find evidence in Australia, massive evidence of ancient civilizations that were destroyed. And then we find there was a point in Australia that was like a point in Lemuria where they decided this just doesn't work competing against nature anymore. Let's become mystics, let's become magicians, and let's give away all these toys and go back to nature. And that's what the American Indians did, it's what the original people did. It's what people did throughout the whole world and lived that way for a long time. And that was in the ascendancy. And then about five to 6,000 years ago, the old habits from Atlantia come back in again and they have to rewrite history to remind people that it's never happened. And that's what they've been doing and this is what we're finding. We're finding about this Lemurian original Pleiadian history is far more complex than this simple lie we've been told about dragging ourselves out of the caves for the first time and we're now the pinnacle of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Heidelberg, the ones that are acknowledged all have brain capacities larger than Homo sapiens sapien. The three beings we found here have brain capacities of 1800 CC. Of all the hominids we've found, the dumbest are the Homo sapiens sapiens. And guess what? We're behaving like it. Oh, we're so insecure because we've got to use the word sapien twice. Yes, yeah. Well, all the other species say they're Neanderthal or Homo Denisovan, we've got to say Homo sapiens sapiens as if we're insecure about our claim, and we should be, because we're not smart and we're not wise, but we are incredibly spiritual. And I think that was the skill we had that was above the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. So what are they doing to us now? They're denying our ancestry, which is the spiritual. Mm -hmm. I mean, we sat with an elder. Evan and I both saw an elder stand in front of us and disappear, and Graham Hancock was there, wasn't he, Evan? Yep, we all got to see that. We all got to see it. And he said, every person on this planet can do what I can do, but they don't know it and I do. And that was his description of how he did it. He also said he was from both ways too, didn't he? See, what? He said he was from both ways. Oh, yes, that's right. He said, the reason I can do this is I live on both ways. I thought, oh, yeah, that's the one we can't find. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what our skill is, but at the moment we don't have it. And you're right, there's a change that's coming, but um, we've got to understand that We've misbehaved, and yeah, there is a change, but there's also a judgment that comes with it. But that's not part of the questions. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm getting a lot of. It's funny because I interview a lot of different people, obviously for the magazine, and the last couple of years, the spiritual, the more spiritual people I've been interviewing, um, it's a lot about 2019 and what's coming this year, and. Yeah. You don't hear it in the mainstream at all. Even even the people that aren't psychics that say they are, um, who who usually love to say there's you know there's doomsday at the end or whatever. Um, no, it's, it, okay. it's just interesting. This year, um, 2019 is the one year that a lot of the psychic people that I've been dealing with um, have been warning me about. Mm. And I don't think there's anything particularly. Um, in any prophecies about it that are really well known, but um, yeah, mm -hmm. and it's oh, due. There to... are. Yeah. Oh, there are. Okay, that's. Oh, there are. Yeah. <laughs> I'll now, that. the original people made this statement. In fact, um, Duncan Start he's done two of these shows and he's doing another one, as we mentioned earlier. And mm -hmm. the reason is Duncan is doing these shows is because the original people, and he'll tell you this, Duncan Rose will say, the reason he put this on, he said, because the original people have never done a prophecy about end times. Not in 2000, not in 2012, but they're doing one now. It's the first time the original people, the oldest from all over the country, and we've heard it, they're all saying the change is coming now. 2019, because some a lot of people are saying the change will be in 2019. I'd say be careful. How about putting a date on this? Mm. Yeah, there have been some and they're coming. And I've heard 2019, 2000, I've heard all the way up to 2000 and what, 22, Evan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a bit of a I, I don't, I do think that 2019 is important because people have to make a change before that sign takes place. People have to understand that the change we've been told is going to take place is dramatic and every being on the planet would fully realise straight away when it happened, they were wrong, if they were wrong. 
And if they were wrong, that's too late. They can't then say, now I want to be part of the team. 2019 is when people have to make a decision before the change. This is more important. The times before the change, when the change happens, don't matter. I know elders, I know original women in particular who said they're coming. I'm just going in the bush and waiting for them. I've got nothing more to do now. I've done my songs, I've sung them up, and I'm gone. And that's what they've told me. I don't know if they're right or wrong, but that's what they've said. But I think this is the year where people have to work out what side of the fence they stand on. Definitely. And there won't be, I don't believe it's going to be this year as such, but I think this is a year where people are going to hear a lot of information and make a decision. And if they don't get it at the end of this year, if they think the system is fine, if they want to keep pushing the system the way it is, that's their statement and that's their vote. I think this is the year where you put your vote in. Yep. No, look, I complete. that is exactly what I've been getting. And um, yeah. this... Uh, a lot of the stuff that's happening in the states, I've I've been following it quite closely. Um, there there seems to be a real like, are you on the side of evil or are you on the side of good? It's it's quite um that, and I've, I never thought I'd ever use terms like that. You know, deciding it's kind of biblical what's about to happen. And I don't think people that's that's how it's been kind of explained to me it's it's actually more biblical what's about to uh, ascend or what's about to happen to us mm. yeah but so we're, like, we're on the same page are we that's good <laughs> yes we are <laughs> right. okay so yeah i've i've um been doing a lot of work on my family actually um Hi. i've been spending a lot of time with my family trying to uh, fix a few attitudes but yeah uh, difficult stuff i don't know if anyone else is doing that you know but i think that's what everyone's supposed to be doing right now everyone that is aware that something's changing their role is very simple in fact our elders got a name for this haven't they even yeah holy warrior holy warriors that's what they're supposed to do they're supposed to go and tell other people listen guys it's not working the, the world is falling apart but you've got to change it you've got to change it within your head now don't expect to build make a building and everyone can sit there and all gets fixed up that won't happen just change your head and get ready for a change. And when it's there, you'll be accepted. That's all they've got to do. But it does involve a leap of faith because mm. you're offering them nothing. You're offering them something that could happen. I mean, yeah. that's the tricky part. It's, and that's the deal with this too. It has to be a leap of faith. It can't be obvious. You've got to have faith for this to work. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, you know, for the first time in oh, – probably 25 years, I've started wearing my cross again. How about that? <laughs> That's, and I, I, yeah, my daughter actually gave me a cross for Christmas. Mm. There you go. And if, if you'd asked me three, three years ago if I would ever wear a cross, um, I would have given you the whole I'm a spiritual person, not a, you know, but things have, things have really changed, you know. Yes, mm. I have. They have. So that's that's the trick, you see. If people can't see the change now, they never will. That's the point with this. This point time around, there are going to be so many pointers and so many indications and so many chances for you to make that leap. If you don't make it this time, what you can, we can we rightfully say to you is you've come back and incarnated time after time after time after time on this planet. You never got it right once. They lower the bar from 100% to 12%. you just got to get over the bar and say, I want to be a good person, I get it. And mm. you still can't do that. Well, I think you're in a lot of trouble if you don't get it right this time. So it really is important for every mm. soul on this planet because if they don't make a choice right this time, I don't think the result for those who choose poorly is great. Mm. That's what I worry about too, yes. Yes, yeah, so do I. Mm. It's, so you've got to keep doing this holy warrior business until it comes. That's what everyone's got to do. They've got to keep grabbing these people, sitting on the fence. They've got a lot of good in them. Mm. They've got to clear out the rubbish, but that's your job. It's our job. Yes, it's <laughs> it's been going on a while. <laughs> it's been a long job, but uh, we'll get there. So I'd like to talk about Adam's Garden because I know you two have um, returned to Adam's Garden quite a few times. Yeah. and. Is it the discrepancies between the rock types of the structures and the natural environment, or is it the smaller rocks and their obvious technological finishes that draw you back? Or is it the fact that you can go there and not not die? <laughs> like other uh, well, hang on, hang on. 
if you got to go through water here, I've got to go on a creek. Yeah, Evan, yeah, can yeah. I swim? No, nah, he can't swim. I'm scared so to <laughs> death every time I've been on it, man. I can't swim. So don't put the death business is still there a different way. And, of okay. course, the guy just rowing, laughing his head off all the time, thinking it's a big joke. No, you've got to do half an hour rowing on water that can kill me. I'm a goat, Capricorn, oh, and I can't good, swim. So no, danger's okay. still there. Danger's still there. But, yeah, in answer to your question, it's an unusual situation because we believe it's a feeder place for the Standing Stone site and other stone arrangements there. We believe there's a wharf there because what we found is where this is, it's basically directly next to the sea. And if you were to raise the sea level half a metre, it the sea would be there. And there's a structure which is nine metres by one metre that goes out into the creek, which is purely made of sandstone. That's all there is. All the other stuff's got all types of rocks, but that's just sandstone alone. And that goes out that full section. And if you look past where that, that pier is, you can see where the water spins around at one point. And you can see, and that's the creek, and then past the creek there's the dunes, and then there's a sea. And you can see that's the, that's the lowest point. That's why it's turning there. We think that was a wharf, and it came in there. And then what we've also got is all the way along the bank, for 110 metres on both sides, you've got thousands and thousands of rocks. If you go anywhere in any other direction, it's either mangrove or sand. It's just in this one section. They're all clustered together. And they're all near the shore. And what we think's happened is they go back into the creek, probably eight to ten metres. And we think the tsunamis come up, gone up the hill, and then come back down and they just rip them all back into the creek for that 110 metres. Now, when you look at these rocks, there are rocks there, and I still remember holding one, and I'll swear to you today because I had it in my hand, that was dripping oil. I don't know what the rock was, but it had a, 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 a oily substance, clear, not oil, but clear that was coming out of it. There was every type of rock you could imagine. One of the rocks was given to me, and it was given to me by the, the custodian of that site and said, take this and show everyone. And it's got about nine sides on it, and the rock is still so sharp, if I run it on my face, I will bleed. And it was really? pulled out of the ground, it was laying there. And it is cut so sharp. And the rest of this exposed would have had the same cuts, but it's been exposed to the surface. And, of course, it's just duller. But the part that was in the mud is as sharp as you can make a rock. And it's got about nine really sharp, perfectly straight cuts. Never done by rock on rock because there's a percussion point. It was cut by a high-precision machine. And there it is laying in the dirt. There was every type of shape rock you could imagine there. And we believe that's where the, the boats would pull up, Egyptian and all sorts of boats pulled up in that region, and that's where the rocks were transported. And then a tsunami which came and hit our coast, I think about 500 years ago, yes. I think that destroyed it, and that would have been before Cook, and that would have been the end of that site. And by that time, about 3,000, 2,000 years ago, the water would have gone back and that would have turned into a creek. And then the sea would have been on the other side. So it would have gone out of use when the sea started to retreat. But four and a half, five thousand years ago, the sea in our area is about four metres higher. That is the right place. And it's interesting, behind that particular spot is the only raised section in the whole region that runs on a ridge that goes directly to where the standing stone side is. So it was taken along that ridge, even when the water was even higher. Wow. Wow. So what what actually draws you back, though, again and again and again? Is it is it just the fact that um, you, you can't work out what it might have been before the tsunami? Or is it the fact that you you may find those that a, a rock like the oil one again? Well, I think the problem is you've got to remember that um, some of this is on private property and um, politically the whole standing stone site is an absolute can of worms and there's, oh man, you don't want to go down that path. Okay. What's going on with that and the way it's been covered up? It's really a very delicate, is that a good word, even more chaotic situation or both? Yeah, both. Both, delicate and chaotic situation at the moment. We know where the site is and we know it's artificial. We know all that and no one's going to take it away. And the mm. people that have at the moment, 
there are many other rock arrangements there. There is a road that runs all the way up there and it was artificially formed. There's a lot of stuff there. But for now, there's so many other parts at the moment. I mean, we've got to get the Standing Stone rec site recognised first, then that one will come next. So and at the moment, the, it is. Yeah, the, the people that actually, like, own the land, um, are mm. they are they fighting to, to make to keep it? private? Is oh, they don't know a thing about that land and to be honest that we've kept that that way. No one knows where it is. Most of our sites nobody knows where they are because we don't tell them. They don't know about the site. We know about the site and we've publicised it and mentioned it. It's only to validate the Standing Stone site. So the idea would be at the moment if, if things we do a GoFunding thing and we buy that site back we would look at getting that site first, the Standing Stone site then there's two associated sites, the wharf site and another site at a different place to go with it. We would try and get them next. But the standing stone site is the important part because the wharf was there to feed that site because that site is 10 acres of stone arrangements and complexes there and those rocks were all artificial and transported. So that's the end point there. That that's very wharf similar to yeah. That, that is very similar to Stonehenge, isn't it? How everything in Stonehenge was brought in from a different location. And yes. there was a wharf, at, is it Southampton, which is the closest port? There was a mm. wharf. They actually worked out a ley line went straight from the site to the wharf and they actually yeah. found a wharf as well. So what you're describing is very, very similar. Oh, by the way, I can tell you those two sites are on the ley line, aren't they, Evan? We knew that. Yes. They run to some other things I can't talk about. Obviously, they would be. You're right. And guess what? It won't just be where we're talking about, and it won't just be in Southampton. These things will be all over the world because it was a different way. We worked with rocks before. Rocks are very powerful objects, more powerful than we are, and they have an energy. And our ancients, when we were of the old way, knew how to tap into that energy and knew how to put them in formations where it could spiral and create the spiral effect that rocks create. So, yeah, they knew about that. So that knowledge was a global knowledge and it was all shared. The whole world was going perfectly until we stopped communicating telepathically and then stopped communicating with the first language. Then we fell apart. Well, do you think, it, do you think the reason it worked so well was because we could read each other's minds. I mean, yes. you have to be you have to be good, don't you? I mean, if you can read somebody's yeah. mind, you'll be able to spot who's good and who's bad straight away. <laughs> so. If everyone read everyone's mind and my elders, and we know, again, we've seen elders do this. We know it can happen. I can't do it, but I've seen people do it. So if, if one person can do it, here's the deal, everyone can. The answer is yes. And if you look at the biblical story about the Tower of Babel, it is, I know it sounds silly, but there's a symbolism behind it. It's exactly what I'm talking about. My elders told me the first language, which is written on the Standing Stone site, and we've got copies of it, mm -hmm. is the second language. The first language was telepathic, where no one could lie. Now, if mm -hmm. you read everyone's thought and they couldn't lie to you, how do you mistrust anyone? Mm -hmm. And if there's no mistrust, why is there a war? Nothing. And nothing's hidden. Everything is told. If everyone always told the truth, if we're all autistic, the world will be perfect because they can't lie. And they mm. think we call that a disability. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> think about that for a sec, guys. Autistic people can't lie, and we call that a disability. I think yeah. we've got to think harder. My point was with telepathy, no lying. First language and everyone spoke the same, same language. Well, yeah, you could lie, but at least we're all talking together. Once the first language went, that's what caused the chaos we have today. We started fighting each other because we didn't trust each other anymore. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So so now there are two gentlemen that I wanted to find out about. I, if you do admire them, um, I think you do from what I've read, and that's Dr. Herman Klatch, Klotch. Yeah, Klotch. yeah Dr. Herman <laughs> Klatch, yeah. And yeah. Frederick Slater, good old Frederick Slater, who's, who's always drawn up were always brought up in every discussion in Australia. Excellent. So well, we should yeah, be. Yeah. Both well, of them should be for different uh, reasons. Clutch is you pretty do? cool yeah. because, uh, because mm -hmm. he, we'll do him first. Yeah, Clutch. Slater yeah. we can talk about for hours. Yeah. But um, Clutch is cool because he was the first person that did field studies. Yep. Um, and, you know, uh, that's where we get our lovely photo of the uh, full descent. Uh, Anu uh, from the last, I think it was the last 
one, wasn't it? Last call to say, yeah. no, no. Klatch took a picture of 1896. And he's a German academic who believed in field studies and decided he'd try something out. He'd go to Australia and do the first field study done by a European. He spent four years in Armand Land. And he wanted to find out, because the huge belief was, and most people believe this, by the way, at that stage, the humans came from Australia. But mm. I've got to tell you about Clatch. He was racist right through, wasn't he, Evan? Yes, yes, yes. He saw the original people as the beginning of humanity and they stagnated in their primitiveness and the heathen yeah. superstitions, all this sort of stuff. He threw all of his racist uh, theories on top of this, but it's important because that makes it even better because he's not there with a the crusade. He's reporting something from his point of view. And what he mm. proved conclusively by looking at this is that the original people were the first people. And I can give you one example of it, because he gave a lot. And he was showing us that he was tracing all the, the first words that were used in Latin, Greek, and stuff like that, and he found all of them in their Aboriginal languages. Found every one of those words exactly the same. And he gave a story of what happened in West Australia with the Lutherans there. And the Lutherans were actually talking to the original people there in German, and they could understand them, and the original people could understand the German. And Klatch came across and they asked him about this and the, the, the Lutherans were quite stunned by the fact that they were speaking literally German. Mm. And they decided, and Klatch reported this, that this is why it happened, because the original people were the most shameful and primitive of all the people at Tower of Babel. We all had the same language and they were next to the Germans and the Germans were there to stay near there and they were banished to the far ends of the earth, which was Western Australia. And that's <laughs> how come they were there and that's how come they knew German. What mm -hmm. Klatch said is, no, all Germanic, all of the European languages come from Australia. So he was doing that basically from listening to the languages and looking at the customs, and he said, no, it all comes from this country. Mm. Slater is different. Yes. Slater will be quick because we can talk a lot more about him because he is a visionary. He was saying things, and I can give you one quote from one of his things where he actually, he was interpreting the engravings in Australia on the rock engravings because he had a dictionary that was done, made by, what's her name, Evan? Eliza Hamilton Dunlop. She, she befriended the original people in the 1830s at the very beginning of settlement. They loved her. She wrote books on their poetry and songs about them, and they gave her a dictionary of the first language. Slater mm. got this 100 years later, and he was just reading the stuff out. And what he was doing, as he went to the Standing Stone site and Baragara, and he kept reading the same story. And the story goes like this. Bayami came here in a spaceship. His wife's name was Mula Mula. And it says in the writings of Slater that she was not born from the earth. She was born from the stars. She never came from here. Then one of the sons of Bayami, nameless one, wasn't it, Evan? Yeah. He didn't like the place, and he wanted to go back and live in the stars where he came from. So he got back in a spaceship that mingled with the clouds, and when it took off, there was fire underneath, and it went up to the Southern Cross, and that's where he lives today. So the first story is about original aliens coming here yes. called Sky Heroes <laughs> and landing here, and he did wrote this in eight, 1939. He's putting this out, and the Standing Stone site is a testimony to what they said and left humans, and it's basically a series of statements spiritual statements of incredible insight talking about welcome to the pillars of heaven and there's all these sayings one by one which he translated and it's all about man came to earth with his seven senses fully developed not five that we have today but the ones we spoke about the spiritual ones we misplaced them. yeah we got dropping things. and that's right and came here with the sacred means of propagating life which is genetics came here to manipulate the original mm. genes. This stuff had been written in 1939. Well, he was smashed during the Second World War and basically vilified. Mm. And his letters, which he wrote, were found about three years ago by Richard Patterson, and we've got the copies of them now. And it's basically a story about this being the oldest temple on the planet and the, a record of the very first language spoken. So in wow. that respect alone, it makes Stonehenge look like an interesting aperitif. But this, ladies and gentlemen, is the main event. Because Slater also said this contains all knowledge that was, that is, and will be. Yeah. 
Oh, and remember, to get to this particular site, the Standing Stone site, you had to do ceremony through 10 acres of other stone arrangements to make your way to even walk onto this site to begin the journey through there. Elders in Australia, we've heard of elders who came from Broome, where it took them three years to walk to this site, and they would spend four years on the site, then three years to walk back. They mm -hmm. came from all over Australia because this was like the university for clever fellas and Williams. Mm. So that's what Slater was dealing with. And the best part was, unlike Clatch, who just thought they were all heathens and didn't believe in magic, he was talking about the fact they had all these magical skills and all the things they could do. And he reported it as it was written. And he did it in 1939 before we even spoke about UFOs. He's writing about it before it's even spoken about. That comes after World War II. Have, um, World War II pilots seeing two pilots like... That's right. Yeah. That's what it begins. Yeah. It doesn't really begin anywhere before then, but he's writing about it in yeah. academic papers. Yeah, an interesting. Yeah, um, just amazing stuff. It really is. So I, I obviously have to do a bit more research on Frederick Slater, that's for sure. Hmm. Well, I've there been isn't much. There's yeah, nothing. There's, there's, <laughs> that's there's, what we've written. <laughs> there's what we've written. <laughs> Definitely one it. article. <laughs> Every paper bar one was destroyed that he wrote. And the one that we've got that wasn't destroyed is stamped cancelled on it. By the, was the Department of Tropical, Tropical Medicine, Medicine, Sydney Uni. Yep. And 1939 uh, is cancelled. And the reason it got through is it's addressed Goddard and Slater. So his name wasn't on it first. That is the only paper that's left, the only record of him. But he was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society, and no one denies that. Wow. But he's got no papers, no papers at all. And the government were paying him money, and they paid him money because he was the only person in Australia they said could decipher Aboriginal writing. Hmm. So they, so in one hand they acknowledged it, and in the other hand they they swept it away. It's incredible. No, I think it, he went too far. He spoke about Egyptians, and they tolerated that because every academic in Australia in the 30s and 20s spoke about Egyptians being here. That was tolerable. We went too far when he spoke about Baragara and people, sky heroes coming in a ship and landing here and taking off. And then he continued with that at the Standing Stone site. And I think that's where the government stepped in. And we know they stepped in because they went up to the farmer and threatened to take his land off him. So we know he stepped in. We've read it. They did that because he went too far. If he kept on going on about Egyptians, well, Sir Graft and Elliot Smith, virtually everyone was talking about Egyptians. That wouldn't have been a problem. That's mm. not an issue. But he went too far by saying, oh, well, why did the Egyptians came here? They came for knowledge that the original people le learnt from these beings that come from space. That was too far. That so, was well, that, too far. Well, so basically um, the Standing Stone site, Lumerian culture and um, Adam's Garden, this is all in the same area. This is the... And this was like a, the ultimate, it's like Alexandria, the library at Alexandria, the place of knowledge. Yes, it was, is. In rock. Yeah. And that, this is why right. now I'm getting tingles here, guys. Um, it's, it's all just dro dropped into place for me now that we've been talking. I've been looking at these things in three distinct ways. And now I'm kind of going, okay, now I understand how awesome this is. It's just kind of moved up the scale for me. So, yeah. um Wow. Yeah, I can see what you're saying now when you compare it to Stonehenge. Mm. Mm. Oh, no, Stonehenge is a lovely spot, but this mm. is where you get... Remember in old times, we believe original was a, 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 Australia was the centre of the spiritual world, and this was the inspiration point. So obviously there are going to be stone arrangements all around the world, but there was one here that was the focal point, the beginning point. And it wasn't us. It was the president of the Australian Archaeological Society who said it's the first temple in the world. You would think because of who he was, and that's why they had to destroy his reputation because he told the truth, and you you aren't allowed to do that, not, not in this place, not in those times or these times. Oh, yes. The these times. So, guys, yeah. we've, we've, I know with Stonehenge, they, they – used to come and have their babies in Stonehenge so, um, on a periodic basis. Would that have been the same for our Stonehenge? It would have been a place of birth as well? Too hard to say. Way too hard to say because there was a woman's side alongside that. 
Evan and I probably know more about than any uh, any other male, and that would mean we know about what one fiftieth of that side. Yeah, that one. I have no idea what the women did there. I know they had their own side because there is never, never a side in Australia where there isn't a site for the women to do their magic alongside the men. Was it usually um, was a male and female from each generation that sent over from each male? Yeah, yeah, it was from each. Yeah, to... male and female. So the women had their started. stuff. And it's hard to say what they did there about where the birthing took place because um, there's different rules at this site than anywhere else in Australia because in other places you do, that's your land, you do your ceremony there. People can't do theirs on that, so that doesn't work, but there it's different. And it's mm -hmm. too hard to say for the women because there are women who could speak on that and they will, and we know them, but I don't know what they did at their site and, and who knows. And I've got, I know bits of it and we can't even say then, can we? No. no, the reason, yeah. Yeah. The, reason I, the reason I'm asking is I was actually born at Stonehenge, mm -hmm. and I was just, I've been, yeah wow. I've been doing a, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research into how that kind of came about, and um, so I was born. Um, I, I initially thought I was born in Southampton when my dad was in the navy. You see, he was stationed there, but um, in those days when you were a couple of days over, they used to tell you to go for a drive on a bumpy road and guess where the bumpy road was? Stonehenge. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. So you can see there, that's where you go. Oh, well, that's brilliant. Well, it's and the rocks, man. The rocks were calling you out. You had to get out there. Yeah. It wasn't, yeah well, I've just... been a few, I've been a few times and I grew up in England, but um, I was, uh, I was actually born in the cafe to the left, not actually in the stone circle. <laughs> not the <laughs> <laughs> I think so, that's as close as you can get. I think you can still get a tick for saying you were there. Oh, can I? Okay, I'll, I'll, oh, get, yeah. I'll take it then. <laughs> now, guys, um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to do some research on Frederick Slater now, and I'll, I'll have a look at Clutch as well. So ufology seems to pop up again and again, obviously, um, thanks to pictographs at Bambara, Bolgandri, and other sites, and Basically, what we've been discussing today, everything seems to have that angle to it. Uh, you, mm -hmm. You've also discussed with the Aboriginal or, and or original elders of their connection to the Pleiades people. Mm -hmm. And uh, was this realisation, the initial realisation, when, when like the penny dropped for you guys, did it shock mm -hmm. you? Were you concerned it might trivialise your research or were you expecting this to, to arise? Did you always have it in the back of your mind that that's where you were going, or was it a complete no. shock? No, 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 not at all. It was kind of not at all forced upon us. All yeah, way. no, so we'll, we kind of looked at each other and went, uh oh, we're not touching it. Oh, no, 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 no. we won't be doing that. Like, no, nah, look, it's not that we just believed in it, we just no. went, that's like a that's a hard road to travel, and then you know, within a was it a month or two? There we were. Yeah, no, look, it was, it's, not, it's nothing. Our first three books were published by University Press of America. There's not one more mention, one word about UFOs or aliens. We deliberately didn't put it in. Not that we didn't believe it. We just didn't. We thought, like you just said, we thought it would distract from the fact we're trying to play science by their games. And as soon as you put little green men and UFOs in, they go crazy on you, man. They don't want to listen to what you've got to say. Even yep. if you say, look, here's the facts. I'm giving you all the facts, which means your theory is wrong. I'm going to give you my theory. What they'll do is they'll attack your theory and not accept the fact that their theory is shot. So, no, we didn't want to touch it. In fact, I can tell you when I was given my first ceremony by the elders, and it was a proper ceremony. It took five, six days of being, being there before it was given to me. I remember after it was given to me, Peter Evans came up to me. He was the keeper of the old ways and the old secrets. And he said to me, we told you that we circumnavigated the world in a figure eight. I said, yeah, that's why I came down, and that's why I did go down to see them. And they called me down. And he said, how do you think we did it? And I said, by boat. And he said, what about the other way? And I knew what he meant, because he meant by air. And I said, I'm not doing that, Peter. He said, what, <laughs> you're not going to go down the UFO path? I said, absolutely not, mate. Under no conditions it's going to distract you much from what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you. That is absolutely the truth. We didn't come into this with a long-term goal to sneak Pleiades in through the back door. We weren't going to put it in any door. We're going to yep. leave it out in the backyard. It's only because the elders kept insisting that every site, and we heard it, every site in Australia, they would talk about the Pleiades, the seven sisters coming from the Pleiades. 
and how we go to Gangamaya, which is in the Pilbara in West Australia, and say, that cave there, if they blow it up, that's the central sister. Our dreaming is dead and our culture is dead with it. I'm thinking, why are you saying that? Then you go to Queensland and I'll tell you the same story about another side. Mm. We had no choice. It was because the elders demanded we talk about the fact that the Pleiadians came here and they shared their genes. That's what they said. And eventually the deal was when we did this, we were told by our elders, we would get the elders' permission. We went on the site and we would tell their story and we wouldn't pick and choose. And then we got to a stage where we had no choice. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah we had to start putting it in because we were told to and we couldn't change it and we didn't want to do it. And it hasn't done us any favours, to be very honest. We could do all the rest of the other stuff, not mention the Pleiades like we do with virtually everything, including the skulls, and it would be an easier path. Yeah. But then if we did that, we wouldn't be telling the story the original not, people gave the, us. It's not the whole story. No, we'd it. be telling the story that the white fellas prefer to hear, and that's what they've been hearing all the time anyway. So, no, we're stuck with it. We don't want it. We made it clear at the start, <laughs> and I told the elders I'm not touching it. And, of course, I was wrong, and they were right. That's just the way it is. Look, no, I compl the reason I'm asking is this is exactly what happened to me. Um, oh. If you'd asked me 10 years ago uh, about this sort of thing, I, like I've always had an interest, but I never discussed it. Now, I'm, like I talk people's ear, ear off about it, of course. And <laughs> But it wasn't really until I had an encounter, which I just couldn't explain, that... Um, I now talk to people openly about it, but I, I spent quite a few years in denial, I think, about, you know, it's it will ruin what I'm what I'm doing here. You know, if exactly. I start, you know, they'll they'll just tar you as this and you know I the work. You're was, right. Got all that right. <laughs> yeah. And right. now well, I think you I just push through though and now I don't care. <laughs> if you you if people want to People still read the magazine. People still um, listen to the podcast. People still listen to the radio show. And um, the messages you get from people are worth it in the end because they don't, they don't feel alone in, in the knowledge, which is great, I think. So, yeah. But, but, yeah, no, I don't, I, but that's why I popped the question in because I know I, it took me years to kind of get my head around it's okay to discuss it even though it has damaged certain areas of my life you know yeah i mean i doubt i'd be i was an it consultant prior and um i doubt now i could ever go back to doing that because it was just seen as you know you know too woo woo you know too um yeah. <laughs> too out there so yes 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 all those words and plenty of others too yeah they're they're all there mm. but they're there for a reason yeah. Now, the, now the cave of the golden boomerang appears to confirm our first contact with the Pleiades people and the star systems. Yeah. I'm amazed more ufologists don't know about this site. Um, I mean, every time because I, I suppose I consider myself a ufologist, and um, I know I chat about it to people, and they they just look at me with like, you know. Uh, that fluoride stare, you know, you know that fluoride stare people have occasionally. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I just kind of, you know, even I've heard of the, the Cave of the Golden Boomerang and I didn't think that was something that wasn't well known. But um, just in case no, somebody else out there doesn't know, would you would you mind yeah. sharing that? That'd be great. Okay. Most people haven't seen it. I mean, we've got, we've got, which book is it in? I think it's in Between a Rock and a Place. We've written about that one. Uh, it's in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, look, it's, it it's um, what it is, it's a cave, which is not like any other cave we've seen in Australia. It's a gallery of three figures they're human figures but they're so representational you could have if they were on the Sistine Chapel you would have thought that's where they came from I can see their toes I can see their fingers um, one of the three figures has dreadlocks you can see dreadlocks and that's pretty weird because I've never seen original people before cook that had <laughs> dreadlocks and they're in poses now the first one is a woman we know it's a woman by her hips because it is that specific and there's a tiny figure beneath her foot, which she seems to be kicking away, which we always wondered about, but it looked like a baby. And I thought, God, there's the baby on the floor, and you're kicking like a Poor soccer baby. ball. Yeah, you're getting kicked around. Then what's it she's doing? She's reaching forward with one finger. And there she puts her finger on the, basically on the ankle of this woman that's got the dreadlocks, and she's floating in the air, and she's reaching towards this guy. 
Now, the guy is standing sort of face on, and then he's reaching up towards the golden boomerang, which has been painted in gold, but I don't think his finger quite touches it because I asked someone if it did, and they wouldn't tell me, of course. Mm. And then these figures are larger than lifelike, like about three metres each, incredibly representational. And remember, according to the experts, Aboriginal people don't do representational work. Well, they do. They're wrong again, as mm. they often are. Now, the weird part was... Um, apparently we're the eighth, seventh and eighth people to find it. And if you paid me $3 million and Evan the same, we could never find it again. No. We thought we were lost and done for, didn't we, Evan? Yes. We ran, we, I just said we're done for and we walked onto the car. We basically we, walked into the car. Yeah, we didn't know where we were. It was getting dark. But the trick is that that symbol, that weird symbol, we just sort of dismissed it as a, a throwaway baby. But it started the narrative. It was in front of all of them, but it was tiny. It was symbolic and everything else was representational. Evan found it, I think. Was it Newcastle Uni, Evan? Yeah, Newcastle Uni. It was one of the librarians had been to one of the sites up there. Yeah. And on his little spiel about going there, which was pretty cool, yeah, he, and he put he up a symbol it, yeah, and he said, this is a symbol for Pleiades and lo and behold, it was exactly, exactly the, same. the same symbol. Now, and, we were told by the elders this narrative was the creation of life and that elders from Armand Land, which is northern New South Wales, knew the full story too. They were working with them about this. It was a famous cave. They all knew about it. And this was a story. And, of course, there was also a Tasmanian tiger on that particular engraving. Now, the Tasmanian tiger has been extinct on the mainland for at least 5,000 years. So we know it's ancient and wasn't done by Europeans because the tiger wasn't on the mainland. So we know it's ancient and it's been redone many times. There's a fair bit of paint, but that's all gone now because no one's done it up recently. But if it's a story of the narrative, now it's not the baby that was kicked away. That's the beginning of the story and the story says the Pleiades and then you've got this woman touching this other woman that's touching the man reaching for the golden pyramid. Now, somewhere in there is the full story of the beginning of life. So, yes, it is obviously, and it starts, the Pleiades is an integral part of that. And these are the sort of things you see. And when you see this, you say, this, well, we can't keep not talking about the Pleiades because it's everywhere. Yeah, there, yeah. there, there, there it is again. Now. At the beginning of the story of life, we've got a symbol for the Pleiades and all the rest of it is representational. The only symbolic part of this was the symbol for the Pleiades. And it sat in the ground, in the dirt. And it wasn't yeah. kicked away from mum. No. It was just making mum. That's right. That's where mum came from. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how perce perception and perspective uh, plays on ideals, hey, when you first saw us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, obviously the, the two of you are not fans of mainstream media um, like myself. Um, have you had any altercations that caused you to rethink your mission, though? Like anything that's kind of made you go... Um, you know, or maybe we should just, you know, have a bit of a holiday for a few months before going back to this particular site. Or, I mean, I suppose uh, Stone Australia Stonehenge would be one of them. But is, was there anything else that kind of shocked you at how how much they um, tried to stop you from going to a place? Well, we've sort of been smiling and laughing at each other. The problem is, which one do we pick? Isn't I know. It? I mean, <laughs> you need to think of the same thing. Which one do we pick? I know. I mean, there was one oh. just two days ago. I, I, I was accused of destroying Australia Day. Yeah, Evan destroyed First Australia me, Day. And one of the, the Courier Mail put up in their main article the fact that Evan, not me this time, uh, I'm pleased to hear that, Evan has destroyed Australia Day. Because what Evan did was he sat down ago. and he <laughs> decided he was bored with the history we had. He's made up a brand new history and he's importing it to the rest of us. And the best part of that story is it wasn't me this time. They didn't mention yeah. me. It's all him. Uh, and they, good. they used the fact that the History Channel's Ancient Aliens mm. team came here, what, two and a half years ago? Yeah, yeah, two and a half years ago. But and they were doing it on like Australia they Day. just did it. Yeah. Like it just happened. And I'm like, that was two and a half years ago, guys. Now, look, the, yeah. you've got the press have attacked us many times, more times than we can count. The government have sent me letters saying they're mm. going to put me in jail. It's good now because to begin with, I used to get letters where they said they were going to do either three years in jail and $750,000 fine or one year, no, six months in jail and $250,000 fine. But my last letter, my third one, 
they were going to give me both. And I thought, I'm doing well now. Yeah. So the answer is no. We get this stuff all the time, whether it's death threats. We've had plenty of them. Oh, they're, they're always good. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> and they're very specific too. It's not just I'm going to kill you. They'll go through the process of how it's going to happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the trick is when these things happen and when the government fights like that, what we don't do is we don't fight back because now they're working with us. Um, mm -hmm. It's taken a while, I've got to tell you. But no, we don't get disappointed because... If the Courier Mail are going to write ridiculous stuff about us and these people are going to do this, it means that we're working and it's working. Yeah. If they're going to fight us and fight us with not fact, none of these critiques have stuff we've said and science we've said. They should just say, oh, they're like this. It's actually a commendation of the fact that we're on the right track because it's exactly. never going to be easy. Exactly. So no, none of it bothers us and most of it, much to their disappointment, when they send me these letters now, I smile when I read them. I mean, I'm supposed to sit there and feel worried about the fact they're going to put me in jail and all I'm doing is smiling. So no, it just means they're getting desperate and they're getting sloppy with what they're doing because they can't take me to court for what I've done because I've never done anything illegal and I've never done anything wrong. I know what I'm doing with these people. I know their games. Mm. Yeah, it's, and as you say, you know you're on to the right thing if this is if this continues to happen, you know you're actually going down the right path. So in a way, they're kind of giving you some guidance without, you know, know. which yeah. is silly in a way. <laughs> well, so. the, the letters have always been about the standing stone site and the skulls. All of them have been about those two. So which of the two we focus on the most, the those ones two. they complain <laughs> about the most. The more they complain and the more we've been slashed with those two because we've copped so much grief about those two sites, the more they do it, it means, okay, that means we're further down the track and we're getting better results. And then eventually they run out of things to do and we then end up winning that battle. Not war. Can't win that war. Their war's too big. But we can win a battle. Have they have they ever closed an area off so you can't get to it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that it also involves black telescopes. No, I can't talk about that. Yeah, no, no they've That's closed it. off areas, and the, and um, the people who there's been threats are going to people are going to get put in jail and stuff like that. Yeah, they've done that. Right now, there is a place we've been to that is closed off to anyone. If they go there, they'll get, they'll be arrested. Yeah, yeah, Must they've done hot. that. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of stuff time. like that. Yeah, anything there... you can do in America, we can do in Australia too, can't we, Evan? Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't worry about that. We can play black ops and all that sort of stuff. We've got black op helicopters. They've come and photographed us, haven't they, at Carry On. They yes. came out and took pictures of us and we're right next to them waving to us. Misfortune where it's right with That would be oh, funny. We had... <laughs> we went, oh, no, no one will be out there. Yeah, we had a helicopter, a red T-shirt in the bush. They tracked us and went around us nine times. I got a red T-shirt in the bush. They couldn't miss us. Half an hour just zero and over watching us all the time. Yeah, that goes on all the time. You've got to laugh about it, but because it's funny. Yeah. And it also proves you when they go to so much trouble, like they put a helicopter out in the middle of nowhere, it just circled us for an hour. How much does that cost? All that stuff just tells you. Our taxpayers' money. Yeah, our money. Yeah, well, it just tells you that we keep doing it. I go out in the bush with a red t shirt. Well, no, not a red t shirt anymore. No. no, green. On each other, but yeah, it does. Yeah, I'm over here. You should get some khaki <laughs> for your next birthday. <laughs> something that you can blend, some khaki wear from a, a surplus or something. Then they'll never oh. spot you. <laughs> oh, I don't mind. I don't mind them spotting us because we we don't we don't hide any of this stuff, and it makes it easier. It's, I think it's a lot safer to be so public. Yes, definitely. You've got to keep the presentations going. And you've got to keep people like me, like um, featuring you on shows like this and in the magazine and things like that, because um, the worst thing is for you to be squirreling away your work. You'll you'll yeah. you'll end up like Frederick Slater, won't you, with none of your papers? Yeah. Mm. Oh, well, they can't kick me out of uni because I'm not working in there. So yeah, you're right, but yeah, mm. but so um. So why do you think Aboriginal Aboriginal elders are a truer form? of historical accuracy what what do you think it is i suppose i suppose the question i'm trying to get at here is what's so wrong with knowing the truth what is so is it what you were just you were trying to explain earlier how nature versus um mechanical i suppose or unnatural versus natural um mm -hmm. i just 
why is it so bad for us to unearth an actual historical find which does oh. question a timeline? I don't understand why that's such an issue, personally. Well, I, I mean, do. Man, I do understand that, yeah. Oh. Mm. It's very important that you buy a narrative, an historical narrative that creates the people you've got today. If you change the historical narrative where we came from and we find out we came from somewhere else, that we're related to Pleiadians, that there were earlier civilization, and we've done this before and we understand fully our history, we'd be less likely to make the mistakes. But conversely, if you want a nation to be fearful, if you want a people to be fearful and not do that, then you've got to try and convince them that that's the nature of what you are as a being. So if we're told that Homo sapiens were here and there was Homo Heidelberg and there was the Denisovans and the Neanderthals and they're all here, but we killed them, we wiped them out because we were stronger and that's what we're told. We pers persevered. Mind you, we were the dumbest of all of them, but it doesn't matter. We did better and then we overcame them and then we came out of the caves and then we conquered all the other animals and they're below us in this triangle that we've created, the pyramid of life. If that is the way we are and for the whole of our history and when our kids go to school, when they learn history, what do they actually learn? They learn about wars mm. and that becomes inculcated into who we are. We say that we are spiritual beings and our skill is in disappearing and telepathy and doing these things and every one of us should be doing it all the time. That's not the history. Of my, I'm a school teacher. I went to high school and primary school. I never have heard that taught anywhere. No, it so, hasn't been. It won't be because that would then start to create a problem about the fact that we spend 50 cents in every dollar on warfare and security. That's because that's what we're like. If it's not true, if that's not what we're like, we're being lied to and manipulated, then you start to question what's going on. So I think to an extent what this does is that if we were to get this information out to prove there were earlier civilizations more advanced than us and that there were different beings that are here and that the whole of our cosmos and what we are, we're galactic citizens, not one planet and all these other beings have been here, you get a different perspective on everything. And you get to think about the world in a different way. And a lot of people who are sitting on the edge wouldn't be on the edge. They'd be standing next to us and they'd probably be listening to your show and feeling sad that you're leaving after today. And there'll be so many more people. There'll be 20 times the audience. But that's the trick. They don't want that. So what we can't let out, we've got to keep that narrative is that we've got this picture of cavemen walking around with a, a club in one hand dragging his wife in through the hair there and they come in. Um, cavemen in Europe, Neanderthal yeah. had piping hot water. That's right. Neanderthal in Europe had piping hot water and they're making out they were dumb. No, not really. And Dennis Sobens were making jewelry 70,000 years ago. Women were wear today, but no, no, they didn't count. They weren't part of it. So the whole thing is they've changed the narrative completely and made out that humans got there because we're the most powerful and the most warlike of creatures is part of our nature. Look, get used to it, and therefore we just keep making wars and we keep funding all this crap. Well, what if none of it's true? What if the last 5,000 years is a dreadful nightmare and before that the women were running the place and we didn't have wars? What if there was a society where women were on it and to be at least the equal of men? That stopped 6,000 years ago and the descent of humanity began when that took place. So all those things happened around that time. So our belief is if you start telling people this and explaining what's happened over the last 6,000 years and saying, we've got to fix it. It didn't work before. Look at the other civilizations that fell apart and they fell apart for the same reason. They upset nature and nature will turn on us. It always does in the long run. We think yeah. we're smarter than the thing that created us. No, we're not. So mm -hmm. that's what we could learn. Now, if we don't know those things, we don't know they're true, but we do know that we grunted and we cave out of caves and we beat up everyone else and therefore today this is what we are we just keep doing it so i mm. think that's what the problem is it's a mindset that they've created to make us think in a certain way and that way we think then makes us fearful and that's what they want they don't want us to realize that actually when Kano disappeared everyone that sat there including graham myself and evan all the others could have done the same thing we could have walked off with him there was a portal open. We didn't see it, but he did. Well, we could have walked in there too. And that's what we need to learn about. Where is that portal? How can I get there? And how can I talk to people telepathically? That's what they don't want us to discuss. And that's what we're finding.
I was going to just point out to you something. Uh, have you? I know Australia's probably full of enough signs to keep you busy to the rest of to your dying day, basically. But I just got back from New Zealand and I spent a lot of time in the North Island this time. And I, I spoke to some of the Maori elders. Have you heard of their legend of Matarika? Matarika? No. Sorry, I haven't. No. It's all about the Pleiades. And oh, is it? I, yeah, I thought you'd like to know that. I'll send you a link after with the details. Of it. I actually bought a book on it. It was as I was watching. I, I went into one of their space dome things, and it had an it had this Maori presentation on Matarika, and um, I thought, oh, this yeah. might you know ki uh, kill a few hours. And you know what? Yeah. It was the most amazing two hours I spent in the whole of New Zealand. It was um just amazing the mythology and the pleiades and it was as soon as it came up i just knew before it even happened i said i actually leaned to my husband and i said i bet you it's the pleiades <laughs> and sure enough t 10 seconds later the pleiades <laughs> popped up on the screen and greg said how did you know that and i said that's where we're that's us that's where our dna's come and most of our dna yeah. came from you know, it's just, this is how it is. So I'll send you the link because if, if you're you. sick of Australia, I can get, there's definitely a New Zealand Ple a Maori Pleiades link as well. Doesn't surprise me in the slightest, but I'd like to read it. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I doubt many hearing our, our broadcast today will have heard of Ross's Rocks and their significance. Uh, would you explain what they are made of? Uh, your theory behind their markings and maps and their usage. I know they all have different uses, but um, yeah. you, you know what I mean, the healing rock and et cetera, yeah. Yeah, Rose's Rock one is the first one of about 180 in the collection where the custodians are, we're not keeping them, they're going back. And it was found about five years ago. And the first time we found it, we were in country with Michael Tellinger. And we both saw it for the first time, and he was as amazed as I was. It was found one and a half metres beneath the surface of a place called Carrion on the top of a plateau, and it would have taken 5,000 years when it was dropped. But it doesn't come from that area because that area is sandstone. This is an incredibly hard rock. Now, what's interesting about the rock is there's all these patterns that have been cut into it, and you'll see them on our website because the picture, there's quite a few articles about it. And the patterns make an arrangement, which we found out is the first language. And the first language is mathematical. And what it does is the, the length of the lines, the angles, the intersections, apparently turn into numbers and those numbers turn into meanings. Now, it looked quite bizarre and then people said this and we thought, yeah, maybe there's something in it. But what we then did is we got Dr. Derek Cunningham and he measured up every angle and we had a chart of all the different angles on there. And he'd been working around the world looking at other rocks that have been marked and caves have been marked with lines and angles and intersections. And his theory was the same as ours. So what we then did is we did compared the rocks on Ross's Rock 1, the angles, to a set of rocks he'd had at Calgary. And of the 21 angles, 19 were on that rock. Then wow. we compared that <laughs> rock to a rock Dr. Samir found underneath the Bosnian Pyramid, which is in Europe, not in America. And of the 15 angles that Dr. Derek measured, all 15 were on Ross's Rock 1. Then we looked at a rock found in Germany with 10 angles, and lo and behold, all 10 angles were found on Ross's Rock 1. So when you go to Germany, you go to Calgary and Bosnia, you find rocks there with angles, and they're identical to the ones in Australia which comes back to our belief there was a first language. And this rock, we think, is a bit like the Rosetta Stone in so far as if we can read that one, we can read the others. And strangely enough, we're working with a gentleman right now that has given me some quite compelling proof because we have a dreaming story that goes with that rock and his reading was exactly the same as the dreaming story. So I'm interested in where that takes. So... That's what we have with this particular rock. Now, the second part of this thing is it's cut, not chiseled. And it's an incredibly hard rock. I could throw it on concrete, and I have dropped it on concrete, and I can tell you it doesn't chip. In fact, the geologist who looked at it said you could go and buy a chisel in Bunnings in a Howboy store, and it wouldn't even mark it. It wouldn't. 
but it was all cut in. It wasn't chiseled in. So that's another point to bear in mind. There's also infills there where there were holes in the rock and another substance was stuck in there 10,000 years ago and still remains to this day. And then there are imprints where it's been stamped. The rock is amazing. This geologist friend said it's the most amazing piece of geology on the planet, didn't he, Evan? Yes, he did. He'd done a story on something else, he said, but this is more bizarre. So what it does is it's evidence of what they've got is they've put a coat on top of this rock and they've melted it on, then cut the story on top of that again. The temperature needed to melt the rock on is around 1,900 degrees Celsius. Then you've got to cut the thing and then stamp it. And we were told by this geologist that stamped that rock and not punctured the surface, which it didn't, it needs 3,800 degrees Celsius. Well, if you don't have those temperatures in a campfire, you just don't throw the rock in and get it to that height. You can't get it. And it can't be cut like that. So it has technology that doesn't belong today, but it also has a language that used to be everywhere uh, many, many yesterdays ago. So it's a relic of the past, and it's a reminder that these rocks also have a power within them that is still present today. And if I can share with you, with these rocks, and Evan knows this as well as I do, Evan, would you touch the rocks? Oh, God, no. I wouldn't, you know. No one in Australia, by me, is allowed to touch them. People who have touched them, what happens to them, Evan, when they touch them? Oh, they usually die. They usually die, and we're not joking about that. <laughs> we're quite serious about that. And It wasn't meant as a joke. I'm not joking at all about that. One person came back to us, didn't they, Evan? Yep. He'd lost about 15 kilos, riddled with cancer, and we used to hear the rock, and I'm told he's better, but he was lucky, wasn't he? Mm. So the point I'm getting at, my wife was going to paint Roz's rock one. What's what didn't she want, Seven? For Roz, and she actually went to paint it, and she touched it accidentally to move it. I knew something was wrong. I was in the house, and she called out, and she had this massive pain in her hand. It would have gone through her hand and would have gone up her arm, and it would have killed her, but we smoked her, and we went through that, and we got rid of that. So the point I'm making with these rocks is that people call them archaeology and we sort of laugh and think, yeah, right, there's nothing here that's dead. It's mm -hmm. still alive. These rocks still have a presence and a power, and that's why they're sacred rocks. So, mm -hmm. yes, they are part of this story, but they're a weird part because we've seen things these rocks have done that will break the law of science. And I can tell you we have actually turned off the security system at Sydney Airport with these rocks. And oh, they, yeah. they, they interfered with the system, completely and utterly interfered with the system. I was actually going through and taking these rocks. I'd take them to a bad place. I won't go into details about that. A really bad place that was full of negative energy. And I had them in a canvas bag on my back. And you go through the security system and it goes through where the X-ray machine is. And we've got all these guys that want to be policemen but couldn't get a job. But they work in the airports and they've got an attitude, haven't they, Evan? Oh, yes. Oh, God, yeah. Anyway, it went through the first time and old mate looks at me and says, what do you got in the bag there? And I says, just rocks, mate. <laughs> I said, is that all? I said, yeah, just rocks. So he picks the bag up, he turns the belt off and he goes through a second time. And he asked me the same question, exactly the same question. He said, what do you got in the bag? And I thought I'd try a bit of humour. It didn't work. I said, what's this, Groundhog Day or something? Didn't go over well. Didn't go over well at all. So anyway, he put it through a third time, asked me the same question. I gave him the same answer because I realised he didn't like my jokes. And then he rings the uh, chief. The uh, white gloves. The white gloves cap and a label, and he wears white gloves. It's not Michael Jackson. This guy comes up and he says, what's going on here? Well, by this time, the line, there's only two machines open. I've got mm -hmm. a fan club, and they're all talking about me, and I don't think it was all good things. They had their hands uh, hands over their mouths, and I'm sure they heard the word terrorist once. Anyway, he comes in, he says, what's going on here? And he says, I'll deal with this. And the other guy gets up, and he sits down, and he gets his gloves on, he puts a bag through there and looks up, and he said, what you got in the bag? I thought, well, I do the ground dog dryer thing. I said, nah, better not. Didn't work the first time. Won't work with him. And I said the same thing. They're just rocks. They're sacred rocks. He said, what else is in there? I said, just sacred rocks. He said, nah, what else is in there? And he said, oh, that's it. Anyway, I did it two more times. And why I did it the sixth time, they did it six times. 
My line went out into the walkway. I had about 150 people lined up and they weren't happy. Old mate then picks up the bag, walks over to me and throws it in front of me. And I went to put my hand on it. He said, don't touch that. I said, what are you talking about? It's mine. He says, not. He said, when things go on that belt, it belongs to us until we give you back. We own every bag that goes on that belt until we give it back to its house. I said, who made that law up? He said, that's the Australian government. And he said, now I'm going to search this bag. I said, no, you're not. And he looked at me. He said, what are you talking about? He said, mate, you unwrap those rocks, which are wrapped in bubble wrap, aren't they? Because yep. they can't touch each other. I said, you're going to die. And he looked at me. He said, what are you talking about? We made that up. He said, that's blackfella law, mate. He said, blackfella law is stronger than your whitefella law. I said, you unwrap them. It's not my problem. It's up to you. Anyway. He took each of the rocks out, but he didn't unwrap them. He shook the bag, shook the bag, shook the bag, put it back in, looked again, and then he looked at me, he mellowed up a bit. I said, mate, what's going on? Six times three, what's the story? He said, well, this is an x-ray machine. It's as good as you can get. He said, we've got the best one in the country. It always works until now. He said, every time we took a picture of your rocks, all we could see was a huge black mass. There was no shape at all. It was huge black energy. And we don't know what it is. We figured it was a bomb. Mm -hmm. What it had been is I'd taken these rocks to a sacred place where we'd, there'd been over a thousand original artifacts that were stored in the museum. Mm -hmm. And they were sick. And these rocks took in all that sickness and they spewed it out on the machine and turned the machine off. They turned the machine off and everyone had to get in the other row. Boy, it wasn't I popular. Mind <laughs> you, I got through. <laughs> the rest of them didn't. So I wasn't very popular. But that gives you an idea when we talk about these rocks, they aren't just rocks they are witnesses of the past and they're witnesses of what we're doing now mm. no that's that's an amazing story so they obviously yeah. just let you go then did they it was too hard basket they handed them back and no they want... handed them back he was scared of them he was scared of them he just didn't understand what was going on and he sort of mellowed up because he was doing a big official act but in the end he was just he just couldn't understand why the machine because they'd done it six times and they'd never had that before. And I didn't think there was any point in trying to explain it to them because they wouldn't have got it anyway. These guys really can't think that way. They just turned the machine off and everyone got in the line and complained a lot. But I didn't because I caught my plane. I don't know about the other mob. They might be a bit disappointed. Basically, the guy that was next, wouldn't you be skewered if you're next? Anyway, <laughs> that's just an example. There's many of them of what those rocks can actually still do. They're part of what's taking place in the future and in the present. And they're here to see how this all spans out. Yeah. And they it, really don't care either way. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's funny. I've got a, um, I have a quantum entanglement machine um, called a Spooky 2. Have you heard of that yet? Spooky 2 quantum entanglement? No, it's, neither of us have. Evan hasn't either. Yeah, no. You're going to love, love this. I want one, though. Yeah, you, oh, you, everyone wants one. It, um, it basically cures illnesses through frequency. And you use your own DNA in the machine remotely. And uh, through quantum entanglement, um, it uses your DNA, which is attached to the machine, to, to send a frequency to your body. And um, I've been reviewing uh, this machine for the yeah. magazine. And I've now bought uh, two more of them. They're just fantastic. I've never seen anything like this. It's, um, I, I, it's kind of sci-fi stuff, but it's, it's here now. And um, I took it on. I was so enamored with it i could i would not leave australia without it so i kind of disguised it as camera equipment to get it into the country <laughs> in out of out of australia and into new zealand and um you know, i had this i had a very similar thing when when i got to uh going through cus, customs and they put it through the the machine the x-ray and i said oh it's a camera it just um it, it helps me develop you know better pictures you know and they're holding it up and they're looking at it because it looks like it's camera, but it isn't. You know what I mean? And um, yeah. so I had, a, I, I just said, I just think it's funny. I had a very similar experience where I, I held up a, a, a probably about thirty people. No, I didn't hold up one hundred and fifty. I didn't kill the machine, but you know, I had a similar experience about uh, two weeks ago <laughs> with the same thing. But anyway, I'll send you a link to the Spooky Two so you can check it out, guys. It's um, Sounds it's. Great. 
Yeah, it's uh, quite an interest. I, I just got one to review because I've been for the last three years. People have been writing into me and saying you've got to you, you've got to review this. You've got to review this. So I thought, oh, finally bit the bullet, and now I don't know how I live without it. It's just mm. amazing. Mm. Anyway, amazing. let's chat about. So it's ended up in um, border security, the television show. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, like when you see if you, I'll send you a link to what it looks like, and as you'll see as soon as you look at it, you'll kind of say, "Oh, it could be something computerized or whatever." But you know, anyway, that, they they didn't know enough, so they just let me go. Fortunately, <laughs> um, but anyway, let's chat about Tracy's tablet and the fact that this could be how agreements or treaties were first exchanged between communities, um, which I find fascinating. Is, is that still what you guys think it is? Yeah, that hasn't changed. I mean, a few things have changed there, but the general concept of what it is, um, the story was that um, it was found between walls of a convict settlement of the first farm up near Parramatta, somewhere on the river, when they were knocking down the convict um, walls of the farm that started in 1794 didn't they? Mm. They built it there. And what they did is they found this tablet between the two walls placed between them. And the guys that were knocking it down, um, they went up to the supervisor and said, what are we going to do with this tablet? Because they had all these Egyptian hieroglyphs on it. And he said, chuck it in the bin. So they decided to take it wow. home. And apparently they threw it some distance and landed in the back of the ute and spit the first time. Mm -hmm. Then they nailed it up on a wall and it split the second time and then they were going to throw it out and Tracy came upon it, didn't she? Yeah. And that's how she picked it up. So the story was it was found in 1794 between those walls. Now, there is a, the same set of symbols in a an Italian museum and it looks exactly the same as this one. Really? And there were copies made of it. And they were made after Napoleon went in to Egypt. And the first copies were made in 1838. But the problem is that this wall, this place was built in 1794. That's 40 odd years before the first copy was made of it. And mm. secondly, the original and all of the copies are plaster. This one isn't, is it, Evan? Yeah, it's got it's plaster, complex. but it's got all these different rocks and crystals embedded inside it. So we feel two treaties were made one was kept in egypt and one was made in australia which is the original which is this one and there is an original story we heard not from tracy's group but from another group that told us that when philip came here the first time an elder came up to the british and, and waved this treaty at them and said we've already got people here go home <laughs> and of course the british didn't go home so that was a story we'd heard from an elder that knew nothing about this and, yes, when you look at it, when you look at the, what's there, there are 300 hieroglyphs and it is a tablet and it's hard to read and it does look like there have been gifts that have been offered. No one's really sure about that. But more importantly, if it was found where Tracy said it was, and let's put, be very honest about this, this story sits on basically the honesty of Tracy what she told us, and if it is true what she told us, then it has to be legitimate. We believe her. We believe her. And she's gained no money from it. She's gained no gr glory from the fact she's still got the, the thing today. And it is interesting that by lineage she is related directly to Howard Carter, who went into Tutankhamun's tomb. So to an extent, there's this lovely irony about the fact that she's in possession of this tablet that the critics will say is a copy. And, of course, I would say to you, yeah, there were copies made. It doesn't make I wouldn't expect to find them in Australia, not, not in the early 1800s. There wasn't that much culture going on here. But the point was this place was built in 1794. So we think it is a treaty that the Egyptians made with the original people. It gave them the right to stay here until about 420 years ago. Wow. Okay. That, that sounds like an, a, a wonderful thing to research, especially um, so if she was related to one of the original uh, tomb raiders. 
my God. Um, yeah, Howard Carter, directly related. I think it's great uh, grand niece or something. Someone like that's that. pretty close, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a blood, it's a bloodline to Howard Carter. So it's sort of symbolic and not beyond, beyond the world for all the possibility that could happen. So she's the custodian of it. It certainly is her pride and joy, isn't it, Evan? Yeah. And um, I'm inclined to think it weighs more than the, the copy and the original, and it's made of different material, and it looks older than the others. The others look more pristine. Some of this is so worn you can barely see them. Wow. But they're all Egyptian. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they found half of the Book of the Dead in the Queensland Museum a few years back, didn't they? And everyone was like saying, "How on earth did they? How on earth did you get that? You know." I and... found so many Egyptian artifacts here that I really find it ridiculous that we're even trying to convince people here. Everyone knows, every elder knows they came here, and there's been so much stuff found here. And the you know, look, we read the newspapers in Australia in the 1920s, the 1930s. They all spoke about Egyptians being here. Different mm. guys were saying all sorts of stuff like this. And they were all professors saying it's all over the place. It's been covered up. It's everywhere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. A lot of the sites you, you guys visit seem to contain rock substances that have been carved or cut in precise manners, as well as relocated from sites miles away. The technology to cut through granite is a relatively new phenomenon. How on earth can you explain how these ancient sites like Trina's Shrine and the Gimpy Pyramid were constructed. Or Peru, really. Well, <laughs> I'll throw that in too. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a variation with the two sites. Um, Trina's site has uh, cube boulders, that would, granite boulders that it's weigh ton. probably six, seven, eight tonne that stand four metres by four metres and they're cut into perfect cubes. And we saw about three of those. Yeah. And we saw where they've stacked 40 rocks in layers on top of a rock platform then it's gone five levels up and they've created what looks like a shrine and this is really sophisticated work with heavy rocks that were stacked on top of one another nearly to the stage of the rocks that we saw at Klaus's tunnels um, and the tricky part is yeah these rocks are purely rock They've, they've granite with with um, crystal quartz inside them, and they're incredibly hard. And like the cube one, which is placed on a rock platform, was placed there, and it weighs ten ton. The technology involved. Uh, look, mm. the moving of the rocks. We think we know how they did that. That was done with silicons, they're special rocks, and we have some of those. But the cutting of the rock, the cut, that sort of stuff, we think it's sound or laser. Mm. We don't think it's chisel. We think it's past that. And there's no chisel marks on these rocks anyway. That mm. particular site, Tina's site, has Tina's site. really sorry. Yeah, yeah. It does. It has amazing cuts, and it's got a an amphitheater where there's all sorts of rocks that have been stacked on top of one another, but not sandstone like the Klaus's walls. This is granite. Mm. Now, the the Gimpy one's different because the walls there. Yeah are much smaller. They may weigh 100 kilos, 50 kilos. And well, it doesn't really matter anymore now because it's now been decided by the Australian and Queensland government, they're going to blow the Gimpy Pyramid up, aren't they? Yeah, put a road through they're it. They're going to put a road right through the middle and destroy the whole site. But the good news is I heard that on the news and what the, we saw two elders crying about it on the Channel 7 News, didn't we? Yeah. But the, the, the official said, well, if we find anything Aboriginal there, there are things we'll do when we pull the place apart, we'll look after them. So they'll find some artifacts as they destroy the whole site, but they will look after them. But wow. yeah, so that yeah. one, Graham Hancock, I think the best way to describe that is what Graham Hancock said, because he wanted to go and see the Gimpy Pyramid. We took him there and he said the walls there, the walls that we looked at, they remind him exactly the same wall technology at Machu Picchu. That's what he said in the end. Machu yeah. Picchu, yeah. So yes, there is that there. There are it's a seven step pyramid. It's legit. It's an earth pyramid. It doesn't look that fantastic when you get to the bottom of someone when you walk up and you find that. And at the top of it is a healing table. And it is an amazing site. But officially now it's in deep, deep, deep trouble. 
Yeah, it was. It's funny. Um, my next question was about uh, the pyramid and the healing table. Um, oh. I I was shown um, a photograph taken back in the 1940s that showed the Australian Army bulldozing the site in Gympie post the Second mm. World War. And yeah. um, I was actually depressed for days after at the thought of such destruction and ignorance on the part of the Australian government. And now you're telling me they're going to put a road <laughs> through? Oh, my God, this well, is awful. They took um, a lot of rocks away and that they made the church and the church walls. They took a lot of rocks away from there. What's left over is the ones they didn't take. And you'll find the rocks are not made the way Europeans do them. They're all different sizes cut into each other. Not big and big with little in the centre, but they're done differently. Yes, and they are putting the road through. I've seen the Queensland government, I've heard them say this is what they're going to do. They've resumed 140 houses and the pyramid and they intend to destroy it. That's the stand at the moment. I don't know what's going to happen there. I know, we know personally the Gubby Gubby people. We've, we've been in contact with them. And they did try to pursue this through the courts. I always wondered why blackfellas keep trying to pursue anything through the courts. For 220 years, we haven't won a thing. You wonder why you do it. But anyway, they did it. They played by the rules. Didn't matter. So, yeah, the Gimpy Pyramid is legit. It's a healing table. Um, and probably one of the strongest ones in this country. We sat down for half an hour. We got a guide there that took us up there for half an hour. He told us the stories of people who got to the healing table, sometimes in wheelchairs, and sometimes they ran down the hill when they were finished. He just told a story after story of people being healed on that site, on that portal. So, yes, it is an amazing site. Both of them are, but at the moment, one's hidden. No one knows where Trina's site is. The Gimpy Pyramid, it's got a six-month six month lifespan, I think, at best. And then the bulldozers will knock the whole pyramid down. You, if there's a portal there, maybe that's why they're doing this. Maybe they're going to put something oh, underground in and the road on top. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. without a doubt. There's no denying that. Not that the people, the engineers, most people know that, but there's people further up that do. Yeah, mm. absolutely. It's an important site. It's a pyramid. It's it's part of our history, and it's going to be destroyed. And this at the moment, we we're fighting for so many of them. It's sort of like you can't fight for every one of them. And it's sad what's going on there, but mm. I can't see that one getting saved. I think they're going to destroy it. Well, I think we've lost that one. I I think they're just going to go underground with it, um, as they've done with a lot of portals around the world already. A lot of these what they call dumbs, these deep underground military bases. They're on port, they're on ley lines and they're on, and they apparently they are at, um, what do you call it when you have more than five points come together? A nexus, is it? Or Yeah, it's something yeah. like that, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they know, yeah. That's where the, yep. the main portals are when the, and basically that's where a lot of the dumbs have been placed apparently, um, from what I've been told. and. So this is probably just another, uh, apparently we have one under the Blue Mountains. There is one in Wollongarra Jennings and there's going to be one in Gympie obviously coming up in the near future. So yeah, it's just a shame that they, they have to do this all the time. Um, again, it's all about stealth, isn't it? It's all about hiding knowledge, you know? It is, yeah, definitely. Annoying. Um, so basically, I suppose that answers my question: Is why do you why do you think they're being so destructive here? And I think I think I've even answered my own question there. So yes, yes, <laughs> the answer is definitely, <laughs> most definitely, and then you're correct, and it's part that of what you do. They're destroying it because they're scared of it. Yeah, you're right. So um, when you did actually go to the pyramid with with Graham, um, what caught your eye the most during the visit? Was it uh, was it the wall structure or was it um, just the, the, did you feel something or, the, or was it the healing table? I suppose it would be the healing. Actually, was it women's business? Could you go on the healing table? I don't think, I don't think it's men and women's business that one and we would have been told otherwise. It was pretty clear to me both men and women have been on there. I'm going to be honest with you, when you go to the Gimpy table, you've got to remember when we got there, they, they ransacked the place and took thousands of tons of sandstone and put it all over the place. So we're looking at the end result. We went there because Graham Hancock begged to go there. We didn't want to go there, did we? Nah. And when we got there, we got down the bottom. What impressed me about it when I saw it from the bottom? Not a damn thing. It looked awful. 
It was blady grass and there was a slope. That's all we saw. I couldn't see a thing. So to be to begin with, it is not an imposing site. I've seen other stuff that's much far grander. That mm. Trina site, we've got that amphitheater of about four different buildings. By comparison, man, Trina site's much better. But you're right. Yeah, I saw the walls, and Graham got really excited about the walls. Was adamant that these are major walls, and I thought, yeah, they're good. They're nice. I like them. But we've seen a few walls. It's it's not new for us to see that for Graham it was, but not for us. But for me, the thing that took me the most was this sitting down with this gentleman that's been fighting for this place for so long, telling me about the people that went up there and the reactions they got. And I'm going to tell you, I had absolutely no doubt. He was telling me things he'd seen and other people had seen, and it was true. So for me, the most important part of this is we have a portal there that has an amazing rock formation on the top that you've obviously seen. It's a portal, and it works with people that, don't believe in Aboriginal stuff, do believe in Aboriginal stuff, don't believe in Islam, do believe in Islam, it don't matter. It mm. works for all of them. You would think if people, if we were homo sapiens sapiens, man, that would be a sacred site and we'd be looking after it and the sick and infirm would be lined up begging for a chance to go there like they do in Lourdes. Mm. But that's France and this is Australia. And somewhere along the line there's a divide there and it's not a very pretty one. Or maybe it will be open to for exclusive access from now on. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, I, I got to be honest with you. I, the, the government are very keen to kill this place, and they've been trying to do it for a long time. And I saw the elders when they spoke, and they both cried, didn't they? Mm. They've given up. They've been fight. I know these people have told me about the fight. It's been going on and on, and they've tricked them and tricked them and tricked them. <laughs> these guys have been fighting for this place so much, it's dragged every ounce of energy out of them. They've just about taken them to the ringers. And that's what they do. They keep stalling and taking them off the court. They want to put them in jail. I know that all four of the main leaders, the elders, have all been threatened with jail terms. They've been threatened to go to court. They're going to take the court for stuff. They've beaten the crap out of them. I think they're going to win. That's awful. Oh, no, it is. Mm. Sorry you asked the question, but I had to give you the truth. <laughs> no, no, that's it. I'd rather have the truth. So, um, yeah. A lot of our more spiritually minded listeners would love to hear about Bolgandry and its narrative of as on top, so below, which is a theme which most spiritual people um, are aware of. What exactly did you find there and is it possible to visit or is it a, another kind of on a map, cross on a map somewhere? No, it is very possible to visit. It's actually got a ballwalk around it. The site's obviously been damaged to an extent by that, but it's not completely damaged. It's got a ballwalk that reads in. It's got signs on the way through. Don't read the signs. They're all rubbish. Um, and then you go around this boardwalk and you'll see all of these magnificent engravings. It's still there. It's still powerful, but not as strong as it has been. But, yeah, it's an amazing story. We were lucky enough to hear it when it was read to ancient aliens. Oh, when you got into trouble, didn't you, ever for that horrible <laughs> anti-Australian show? And Gabby Duncan, who was the custodian that took over the place after Aunty Bev spoke, came in his lawman coat, the great kangaroo coat, and he told them the story of Bulgandry. And the story very simply is this, the Bulgandry, which by the way, he doesn't have a neck, he has a helmet or a hat, as Aunty Bev calls it, has nine rays coming out of his head, and he's actually thoth, because he holds the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, and he holds them equally. And beneath, his foot sits on a, a nine metre canoe, which is the largest canoe I've seen engraved anywhere, and according to our Gabby, that's the spaceship which they came through the Milky Way. And there, jumping out of that spaceship are three different kangaroos. And this one shocked me because I'd never heard this one before. And Gabby said the kangaroos came from the Pleiades. They brought them here. And that's mm -hmm. why they're animals that can choose when they fall pregnant and can keep that gestation going for five years or abort if they need to. And no other animal can do that, but kangaroos and wallabies can. So they came from somewhere else. So it's a story about them coming through there and then Across Bulgandry is the Arnie Bev calls it the belt of Orion, because as we know, when the Pleiades comes, so does Orion come chasing the women. So it's a story about the beginning, and they're coming in a spaceship, and he's got a helmet on, and there is his wife. And she's on the other side, and she's holding the, the tail of the law kangaroo, which means she's holding the law. She contrariates the law. And people need to understand that makes her more important 
than Bulgandri, who we would call Thoth, because she controls the law and she's also pregnant, isn't she, Evan? Yep. And then Evan found out, much to my chagrin, that it actually is broken up into 12 houses, isn't it? Yep. Six come from the water and six come from the land, like the horoscopes. Yeah. And he managed to, yeah, and we didn't notice that. Well, I didn't notice, and Evan did. And he found it out when he was with Graham Hancock. Now, what he should have done is come and told me, so I could have announced it to Graham and big note of myself. But no, he comes and says it in front of Graham and makes me look like an idiot because I never saw it. And it's broken up into 12. And in the middle is a diagram of what we think is a piece of sperm. Yeah. Don't we? Right in the center of it all. Mm. So it's an amazing 12 part, 12 house story. Six of the animals come from the land, six come from the water. And they're all engraved around. And you've got the sky heroes, which is Borgandra and his wife, bringing mm. life to this planet. And that's all about what Slater said: sacred means of propagating life. Yeah. So that's what that story is about. And the golden boomerang. Same story. Yep. Same story. We find it all over the country, and that's why when you asked at start, why do we keep talking about the Pleiades? Because this is what the archaeology says. It keeps telling the same story. You have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, it's the only story told by each original tribe. All 500 have the story of the Seven Sisters. It's the only story we share because it belongs to everyone in the country, because it belongs to the heritage of each original person, and indirectly because the original people went out to the rest of the world and gave us their genes, which I've got too. We all have Pleiadian genes within us. Well, didn't they find with the DNA um, that it is mm. it, the original DNA of what we call our, our current modern day Aboriginals is the initial DNA? Basically, there's. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's got every, yeah. yeah. And there's also mystery genes that aren't in any other race that are found in original people. They have the highest Denisovan content in the world. I'm 4.7%. Some original people are 6% Denisovan. They've got other genes no one else has got. You've got to remember the Africans who are supposed to be the oldest race on the planet have no Denisovan genes and no Neanderthal genes. We have them all and other mm -hmm. genes. Uh, yeah. African genes have yeah. six genome patterns. Original genes are 34 patterns. Everybody knows the original genes are the oldest. And what we've got to work out is what are those mystery genes inside the original people they can't identify and they've compared to every other hominid on the planet and they can't find them. They are the Pleiadian genes and of course we believe we have the Pleiadian skull. So therefore we're going to find those genes inside that skull and that will complete the process. Perfect. That, that would be great. And were you? I think you told me on the last show that the dingo is also not related to anything else on the planet. Is that is that correct? It's genetically correct, and that was done by Sydney Uni, not by us, and it wasn't done by Chandler, was it, Evan? That's right. No, it was done by scientists, and it freaked them out because they wanted to prove the dingo was related to a dog in India or somewhere, and they came up with a thing. They had to make a new species for this dog, and it can't be related to wolf or any hybrid dog. Mm. So yes, it doesn't have any, it doesn't relate to anything on this planet. And this is where I'm gonna start talking about the fact that some of the animals we've got here, I'm starting to think some of the animals we've got here weren't always here too. And the dingo is a very good example of that. It's 30% smarter than any other dog on the planet, doesn't bark. We treated, the original people taught, treated the dingoes as humans didn't treat them like any other animal. Many original women would wean and suckle dingo dogs as animals, as babies. But they're treated differently in the dreaming and they don't relate to any other dog. So why should they relate to any other dog? Because maybe they didn't come from here. They came from somewhere else. That's the story we keep hearing about. Yeah, that makes, that makes more sense. And I think there was uh, a piece of artwork which actually showed the dingo arriving on um, a symbolic ship. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what, that's what, this is the whole point. Because now we found out it wasn't just the dingo, it was probably the kangaroo too and the wallaby. They all came here. So, and, and I mean, you've got to think about it. They're all different to the other species. <laughs> no one yeah. can explain. 
in the platypus. Let's let look. Can we oh, find that? Oh, yeah. What the hell is that? <laughs> oh, that was just done as a joke, just to keep everyone happy. There's a bit of everything there. Uh, now, all, all the pla all the animals on this pla on in Australia are so different from the others, and they make out that oh no no, this is just a subspecies. No, we've now found that basically all birds come from Australia. Right, that's now been proved. All songbirds on the planet originate in Australia. Australia is the oldest place, and then they say somehow or other we've got one species of animal just here, but nowhere else. No, it doesn't work like that. No, they'll brought in. Mm. Yeah, it se it seems more and more. Uh, the more that's discovered, the more it's obvious, isn't it? So yeah. um, yes. so I have a reader's question. Um, All right. I have not the name of the reader, but I think his name was Chris and he was from Sydney, if, if my memory holds. And his question was, whenever you inspect a marking pictograph on a hard surface, do you normally find that the techniques and therefore the tools used to make the markings far superior to what we have been led to believe existed by both science and historical records? Well, that's a yes, really, isn't it? <laughs> Well, it's an absolutely yes at so many levels and we sort of have covered it but yeah we the have. argument it comes down to is it sound uncle jerry said it was laser on the walls that carry on didn't he yeah or is it a combination of both and what we can say is we've seen examples of work and we've got a rock that's just come in and fits into that category doesn't it mm -hmm. that i swear to you today you get your best mason out and give them the best tools they've got and they might pull it off. They may pull it off if they're lucky. But I've, we've got a rock right now. It's about to go off. We'll be up in about a week or so. That has a level of skill and exactness and parallel of line and straightness of line and so many levels to it that it's just beyond the possibility of anything other than that the hands of the greatest mason you're ever going to see, but also a mathematician. The ratios on some of these rocks we've got is outrageous. So, yeah. He's right. The technology, you've got to remember, we have skulls in our house right now that have brain capacities of 18 to 1700 cc, and we've got 1300. The people who left this message for us were far more intelligent and sophisticated and technologically aware than we are today. And they left us as a message. For, <laughs> they didn't realise what they were leaving it for. They mm -hmm. left it for bloody 7F. <laughs> they didn't get 7A or B in high school. They got yeah. all the kids in 7F. We're the, the ones who failed so many times. We're trying to work it out. We think we've got someone who might be able to read it. But, man, this guy's been doing this stuff for 10 years and it's right out there on the edge. But he might be able to read it. But it's going to have to be someone unusual who can read this because it's beyond the scope of our paltry 1,300cc brains to work out what was written there. So, yes, he's right. This is not the highest civilization in technology. Don't fool yourself. It's not that. We've seen that already. It may be the second highest. I don't know, but it's not the highest. There's been better. And this one has probably been the dirtiest. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so I've got a general question here, again from a, a reader. What's next for Stephen and Evan and the Forgotten Origin team? Um, is Are you still kind of spending a lot of time on Australia's Stonehenge or is there something you can tell us about that's in the works? Mm, well, Stonehenge always because we're locked into it. But no, we're trying to get Stonehenge to write on the back of the skulls we've found because the skulls we've found, we've had experts from all over this country have looked at them and the skulls we found are not hominin and they're not homo sapien. And we know that, and every expert has looked at, they may not go the same way where we think they're Pleiadian, but they will agree with you. There are characteristics about this skull that don't fit into anything that's ever been found anywhere. It's become our major focus. We have been to the burial site where the first one was found. We were gifted the second one that's with us. And we know where the third one is, and we're going to that one next. In fact, right now, as we speak, we're in the process of setting it up, aren't we? Yes. We have a crew that's ready to take us on country, and they're highly organised. I have now got the two people talking to each other today, and within a couple of months, we'll be out in the country to find the third one of these skulls. 
that basically, for your listeners, if you haven't seen them, has absolutely no fault. Its skull case is bigger than ours, but when you get to where your eyebrows are, it goes directly backwards. It doesn't go up at all. And it mm. slides back 19 centimetres. It has a much wider and longer brain case than ours and far more intelligent. But there are problems with it, like there are no suturing, and all hominins have sutures. There are eyes that are bigger than any eyes ever found on this planet before. It has a, a humerus, which is the top part of your arm, which is at least 50% longer than any human that's ever walked on this planet. There are so many things about this thing that don't fit in. It's not just our belief now. The people working on reconstructing the skull are stunned by what they're looking at, and these are the top experts in this country. And we have other academics ready to do science if the government will approve it. And it's possible the government will approve it. And we won't go into that long and protracted story, will we, Evan? Oh, it's a long... Oh, God. We need four hours of that. But anyway, that yeah, is look, our major, our major have... focus is that. Well, guys, I have a podcast now. I can do it whenever you want. <laughs> Just tell me. Um, we have another question, this time from our online chat. Um, we have a reader... Stardust Man, I think, or was it Bobby? Oh, you've got two, the same question from two people. Um, oh. Do you know if the original Aboriginal people are RH negative blood types? Yeah, well, here's the trick with this. So we went into the, I wish I had the paper on it because, God, we've done so much stuff. We went into that with the RH negative, and what we found, we did a study of the blood and there's about seven, there's three different ways you can group them. Okay, so I can do this generally because I can't be specific. What we're finding with the original blood is in some cases it's the highest on the planet. In other cases, there's none. And what you find is that it's not like anyone else anywhere. And the problem you've got to remember, they're supposed to be original people. are all supposed to descend from African people. There's nothing in the blood grouping. In fact, I think Josephine Flood said that the original blood is the most unlike African blood on this planet. So uh -huh. there's things about RH negative, and I can't remember them all because uh, I'd have to look at it. But there is a point with RH negative, I think it's incredibly, I think it's either non-existent or the highest. It's one of the two, but I can't remember which. I wish I could be more specific. I think we've got it in some articles, but I can't remember it now because... Oh, there's so much stuff going on with all the RH negatives and the Y chromosomes. You can't remember it all, but there is something about that. But I can't be more specific than that. I wish I was. Could be. That's okay. I'll see if I can do a bit of research after and post it here yeah. later. No, so, but there is something in it about that with the RH negative. And I've, I've looked is. at it before. I can't put my head on it. Excellent. Well, I know in ufology, um, I'm wondering if the question was asked because in ufology, people with RH negative are seen as hybrids or starseed children and yeah. people that have uh, like half their DNA is Pleiadian and or a percentage of their DNA is Ple Pleiadian. Um, and apparently people with RH negative blood from a ufology perspective um, have abilities or are able to do certain things like be telepathic and telekinesis. Yeah. Look, I'm 98 percent sure it is the highest, but I'm, I don't want to say that because I can't be 100 percent sure. I know what you're getting at, and I'm mm. pretty damn sure it's the highest they've found. But I don't want to say that because I can't be sure. And if I, we say anything that's even marginally wrong, believe me, we find out about it, don't we, Evan? Oh, God, we never hear the end of it. I, I'm pretty oh, damn sure what we're saying is right. But yeah, I know where you're coming from. I'm sure that's the case. Yeah, but I won't say it. <laughs> Not a problem. It's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get something on on. Yeah. The you probably find out that's the answer. Cool. So do you um do you feel that well actually I'll ask the next question. What major challenges do you see the field of archaeology facing in 2019? And do you think or know for certain if your beliefs and findings of other Australian archaeologists, for Australia being home to the original people, will become widely known and accepted? There does seem to be, it has seemed to have turned a corner in certain areas, I've found. Like more people seem to be receptive to it than they were, say, when you did your original presentations five years ago. 
Yeah, well, it has happened, and I'm pleased to say, I'm um, being preemptive here, that it seems like we might be working with top class academics throughout Australia. Some of these guys haven't fallen into line, and I, I'm not going to mention their names right now, but that's happened. Um, yeah. As I said, we, we've, we've probably fought with the government for years now, and I think we're on top of that one now at the moment. We're still being, we want to share everything with them, and they're starting to get that. So, yes, I do feel <coughs> that we've noticed that all the academics that, in fact, one of the other academics that's been fighting with us for five years and he's a, a, a highly respected academic, but wouldn't put his name up and still won't, he said mm -hmm. he finds it amazing with the, the anger and the swearing that comes with the mention of our name, it becomes very emotional. And he can't understand why they can't accept a different point of view. And yes. I think to an extent, it's because we're challenging the foundation of what they base their belief on, these people who are archaeologists. And what we're saying, and it offends them a lot, is that you walked into the most sacred site on this planet and you never gave that respect. And we've mm. said that you didn't do this the right way because you didn't acknowledge the spiritual part of this equation and you've lost it. So I think now that that is starting to resonate with some people. And I think also the science that we brought into this and the genetics, the way the genetics has just thrown the whole, whole of out of Africa into chaos. I mean, Chris Stringer is considered the top archaeologist on the planet. Anthropologist. Anthropologist, sorry. He's just written a paper called Rethinking the Out of Africa Theory, where he says, I'm sticking by it. And then he gives me five different reasons why it's so tenuous and doesn't make sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is starting to fall apart. It was tenuous. It was... Uh, this is what happened for sure. Now people are saying maybe, just maybe. All we know was the start of the 1900s, the popular place with academics around the world was Australia for the beginning place. That is actually true. It only changed with Leakey in Africa because they found all these hominids. But people need to understand something. The oldest hominids in the world are not found in Africa. The oldest hominid in the world is 9.7 million years and is found in Siberia, followed by two hominids found in Bulgaria and Greece at 7.4 and 7.2 million years. You want a hominid in Africa? It's four, maybe five million at maximum. So don't talk about hominids beginning in Africa. That didn't happen. The oldest homo sapien, the oldest homo, uh, sorry, Neanderthal and also Denisovan found in the world are not found in Africa, they're found in Europe, 740,000 years. So the whole of that theory is tenuous at every level. Now what we're saying is, forget about Africa, come to Australia, this is where it began, the elders have all said the same thing, and now the evidence, whether it's archaeology, whether it's genetics, whether it's right, Y chromosomes are saying the same thing. So yeah, we do feel like it is changing because the science, is backing up the truth, and that's yes. important. It's I've, I've just noticed on my YouTube, um, people that I've interviewed, like Rex and um, Heather Gilroy and yourself, your videos, for some reason, have just exploded in the last year. They they may not have been viewed for, you know, a couple of years prior with and then suddenly it's just, it's like an explosion has happened. And I've now, I mean, I think the Rex and Heather Gilroy interview I did um, just surpassed 2,000 views in less than three months, which is huge. Yeah, it's, it's, I think you're going to find the last year or so that it, it is starting to kick on and people are starting to pick up the story that's taking place and then we're open to it. So. Mm. We'll just keep saying what we're doing and keep doing what we're doing. We just keep doing science. We're trying to put science and, and the spirituality in the same boat because they are. They are. And what we're trying to do is prove that um, we're capable of so much more and we're finding this genetically and now we've just got to listen to what the story they gave us at the Steaming Stone site. They gave us some carrying about how we should behave ourselves. And I can tell you right now, I read what they wrote and we aren't doing it. Yeah, I agree. I agree there's that there's as we discussed at the beginning yeah there's there's certainly something coming would you would you mind um giving our readers a feel for what 
a typical day is for you guys? This is something I've often wondered too. Um, like, what would, do you actually have a thing called a typical day? I mean, or do you, you actually have a, an outline or is it all seat, you know, by the bottom of your pants sort, sort, sort of uh, thing? There's no such thing as a plan here. No. We don't make any plans. <laughs> we never plan anything. Like people ring us up and say, do you want to do a talk? We say, yeah, we'll do it. But we don't plan that in advance. In the same way, when we get up in the morning, I mean, we've got a book, the newest book, which we're just about ready to put out. And it's going to be massive, about maybe 200,000 words. We do that a bit. Um, oh, and then wow. what happens is, we react to the day. Yeah, yeah. We're very Every day, we somebody rings up, emails, somebody says so something, on. sends us something. We have no idea what's going on each day, and every day is different. And what's been happening recently is most of the stuff we've been getting is mainly better, isn't it? Yeah. Before we were reacting to a lot of heavy stuff, we still get plenty of that anyway, but there's no plan because every day is different and half the time we get surprised about what turns up and I mean people are sending us rocks continually they contact us about that we get amazing rocks all the time and mm -hmm. sometimes they send us to us sometimes they don't and then some archaeology comes in planning this trip to, in the middle of Australia to see the site that's sort of coming together and then then I get a phone call about the standing stone site what are we doing about that it doesn't it's every day there's nothing that's the same. We couldn't make any plans because it wouldn't I, happen. I, 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 you were talking about rocks before, and it just took my mind back to. Um, I think you've made me a bit of an addict of rocks now. I mean, um, every time I pass anything that um, I pick it up and I hold it and I see what the energy is involved now. Uh, since I since I saw your presentation on it, which is a few years back now. And when I was in New Zealand, I went to Christchurch Museum. Have you been down that way at all? Yes, I have. They yeah. have the most yeah, I, mean, I went to the doors and met some of the guy that runs it. Yeah, I do remember that place. Yeah, love, wonderful spot. Is it? Yeah, I but do. Did you go into the museum? Did you go into the, they had all the green, uh, the green rock display and they have an Antarctica display and yeah, they have yeah, original... Yeah. And they have the meteor meteorites in there as well. And honestly, I I just actually lose it now when I see a, see things like that. And it's all thanks to you guys. <laughs> so thanks for that. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. We will remember the earth is made of rocks, so we better get to it and get to know them a bit better than we have because the whole place is made of this. Oh yeah. And they're, they're aware of what we're doing. Yeah. It's um so. I imagine you've lot you've hit a lot of skepticism from traditional archaeologists overseas. Um, I'm sure the Australian ones are pretty much used to you guys now. Um, Read your belief that original life began here in Australia, um, and I know that there was a magazine that actually um, promoted it when you first um, started discussing it a few years ago, and that it was on the it was on the Scientist, wasn't it? New Scientist or something, and they actually said. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. There was a scientific yeah. paper, yeah, yeah. And they basically, they all had a heart attack over there and um, started denying it and or whatever. And how how is it now with the overseas, these people that have read, written their own books on it and been disproved, basically? Um, is, are you just generally ignored or is there, is it improved overseas as well? You know, even though you know, obviously we're getting reactions in America and, and India and places like that, and they, they are listening in Australia. No, no, it's going to be much harder there. We think we're in the process of breaking through that. That's one of the things that we're working on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, but no, no, Australia is, is, is awful. But oh, okay. um, we're, we're yeah. at the stage now where I think we're going to get through that. We actually thought we we're going to break through in another country, which we can't talk about because of the opportunities there. But mm -hmm. it seems like by the time the year's out, we might get through Australia and then get to these other countries and follow through. I, I do discuss the resistance um, yeah. uh, against us in uh, the latest book, actually. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, self indulgent like that. Yeah, so. we did get in. Evan gets indulgent and complains about the fact we get all these trolls and stuff. And, and, and try to account for why, you know, because yeah. my background's mm. psychology and well, stuff yeah. like that. I, I, I like to kind of work out why things are the way mm. they are. 
So uh -huh. yeah, but all right now, no, look, um, we're, we're at a stage at the moment now where we're so used to them fighting and, and calling us names and stuff. It actually doesn't make any difference to us. It doesn't matter what they say and what they've done. Mm. They've already done. They've done everything yeah. they can. There's nothing left. So we don't care anymore. So I don't take much notice, to be honest. Although and I haven't run Christmas yet. Christmas could be next. Christmas? Uh, yeah, well, I ruined Australia Day. Oh, that's right. So well, that's your, I could run that's Christmas. That's your problem, mate. Yeah. I, I don't deal with that. You're the one who's destroying mainstream with your horrible theories. I'm not into <laughs> that. Definitely. Definitely. Evan the uh, destroyer, hey? So, oh, it's yeah. got a bit of spring to it, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> If you had, uh, just have a think about this next one, this next question. What is the most important lesson you both have learned from your work with the past? Just have a ponder. Yeah, that's an easy question, really, because the answer for me is pretty straightforward. Both Evan and I, we've met elders that maintain a tradition or way of living that I actually thought was lost. When I speak about these diff different people doing this sort of stuff, it became obvious to me that that's actually what humans are. So what we've learned from this is we've seen it in the archaeology, but we've seen it with humans that do things that we would call, a scientist would call magic. And I'm a scientist. We do, I do this pragmatically. I try and make this as empirical as I can. But I'm at the stage now, now where I don't doubt for a second that all of these stories about what the original people did telepathically, telekinesis, and all these things that we hear about are actually what every human on this planet is capable of doing. And that to me is the greatest travesty on this planet, that we aren't fulfilling our destiny. And I think that's what disappoints so many of our visitors from afar. What we've learned is this planet is unusual and special. I've been told more than once the trees grow on very, very few planets. They are special and sacred where trees grow and we have the most diverse set of trees anywhere in the cosmos. That's what we've learned about this place. It's special. It's the first amongst equals and we're trashing the place and we've done it before and this is the last time this will case. Yeah, but I won't say it. <laughs> Not a problem. It's okay. I'll I'll, I'll get something on yeah, on the, the chat. Later. Find out that's the answer. Cool. So, do you um do you feel that? Well, actually, I'll ask the next question. What major challenges do you see the field of archaeology facing in two thousand and nineteen? And do you think or know for certain if your beliefs and findings of other Australian archaeologists, re Australia being home to the original people, will become widely known and accepted? There does seem to be, it has seemed to have turned a corner in certain areas I found, like more people seem to be receptive to it than they were, say, when you did your original presentations five years ago. Yeah, well, it has happened and I'm pleased to say, um, being preemptive here, that it seems like we might be working with top class academics throughout Australia. Some of these guys haven't fallen into line. And I, I'm not going to mention their names right now, but that's happened. Um, yeah. As I said, we, we've, we've probably fought with the government for years now, and I think we're on top of that one now at the moment. We're still being, we want to share everything with them, and they're starting to get that. So, yes, I do feel <coughs> that we've noticed that all the academics that, in fact, one of the other academics that's been fighting with us for five years, and he's a, a, a highly respected academic, but wouldn't put his name up and still won't. He said mm -hmm. he finds it amazing at, with the, the anger and the swearing that comes with the mention of our name, it becomes very emotional. And he can't understand why they can't accept a different point of view. And yes. I think to an extent, it's because we're challenging the foundation of what they base their belief on, these people who are archaeologists. And what we're saying, and it offends them a lot, is that you walked into the most sacred site on this planet and you never gave that respect. And we've mm. said that you didn't do this the right way because you didn't acknowledge the spiritual part of this equation and you've lost it. So I think now that that is starting to resonate with some people. And I think also the science that we've brought into this and the genetics, the way the genetics has just thrown the whole of out of Africa into chaos. 
I mean, Chris Stringer is considered the top archaeologist on the planet. Anthropologist. Anthropologist, sorry. He's just written a paper called Rethinking the Out of Africa Theory, where he says, I'm sticking by it. And then he gives me five different reasons why it's so tenuous and doesn't make sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is starting to fall apart. It was tenuous. It was, uh, this is what happened for sure. Now people are saying maybe, just maybe. All we know was the start of the 1900s, the popular place with academics around the world was Australia for the beginning place. That is actually true. It only changed with Leakey in Africa because they found all these hominids. But people need to understand something. The oldest hominids in the world are not found in Africa. The oldest hominid in the world is 9.7 million years and is found in Siberia followed by two hominids found in Bulgaria and Greece at 7.4 and 7.2 million years. You want a hominid in Africa? It's four, maybe five million at maximum. So don't talk about hominids beginning in Africa. That didn't happen. The oldest Homo sapien, the oldest Homo, uh, sorry, Neanderthal, and also Denisovan found in the world are not found in Africa. They're found in Europe, 740,000 years. So the whole of that theory is tenuous at every level. Now, what we're saying is, forget about Africa, come to Australia, this is where it began, the elders have all said the same thing, and now the evidence, whether it's archaeology, whether it's genetics, whether it's right, Y chromosomes are saying the same thing. So yeah, we do feel like it is changing because the science is backing up the truth. And that's yes. important. It's I've, I've just noticed on my YouTube, um, people that I've interviewed, like Rex and um, Heather Gilroy and yourself, your videos, for some reason, have just exploded in the last year. They they may not have been viewed for, you know, a couple of years prior with, and then suddenly it's just, it's like an explosion has happened. And I've now, I mean, I think the Rex and Heather Gilroy interview I did, um, just surpassed 2,000 views in less than three months, which is huge. Yeah, it's, it's, I think you're going to find the last year or so that it, it is starting to kick on and people are starting to pick up the story that's taking place and then we're open to it. So mm. we'll just keep saying what we're doing and keep doing what we're doing. We just keep doing science. We're trying to put science and, and the spirituality in the same boat because they are. They are. And what we're trying to do is prove that um, we're capable of so much more and we're finding this genetically and now we've just got to listen to what the story they gave us at the Standing Stone site, they gave us some carrying about how we should behave ourselves and I can tell you right now I read what they wrote and we aren't doing it. Yeah, I agree. I agree there's, that there's, as we discussed at the beginning, yeah, there's there's certainly something coming. Would you, would you mind um, giving our readers a feel for what a typical day is for you guys. This is something I've often wondered too. Um, like, what would, do you actually have a thing called a typical day? I mean, or do you you actually have a an outline, or is it all seat, you know, by the bottom of your pants sort sort, sort of thing? Uh, there's no such thing as a plan here. No. We don't make any plans. <laughs> we never plan anything. Like people ring us up and say they want to do a talk, and say yeah, we'll do it, but we don't plan that in advance. In the same way. When we get up in the morning, I mean, we've got a book, the newest book, which we're just about ready to put out. And it's going to be massive, about nearly 200,000 words. We do that a bit. Um, oh, and then wow. what happens is we react to the day. Yeah, and yeah. We're very every day we'll get somebody calls, rings up, emails, somebody says yeah. something, sends us something. We have no idea what's going on each day and every day is different. And what's been happening recently is most of the stuff we've been getting is mainly better, isn't it? Yeah. Before we were reacting to a lot of heavy stuff, we still get plenty of that anyway, but there's no plan because every day is different and half the time we get surprised about what turns up. And I mean, people are sending us rocks continually. They contact us about that. We get amazing rocks all the time and mm -hmm. sometimes they send us to us, sometimes they don't and then some archaeology comes in. Planning this trip to, in the middle of Australia to see this site, that's sort of coming together and then then I get a phone call about the Standing Stone site. What are we doing about that? It doesn't. It's every day. There's nothing that's the same. We couldn't make any. 
this because it wouldn't happen. Uh, no, I, 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 when you were talking about rocks before, and it just took my mind back to, um, I think you've made me a bit of an addict of rocks now. I mean, um, every time I pass anything that, um, I pick it up and I hold it and I see what the energy is involved now. Uh, since I since I saw your presentation on it, which is a few years back now, and when I was in New Zealand, I went to Christchurch Museum. Have you been down that way at all? Yes, I have. Yeah. They have the most. Yeah, I went, amazing... in, I went to the doors and met some of the guy that runs it. Yeah, I do remember that place. Yeah, love wonderful spot. Is it? Yeah, I do. But did you go into the museum? Did you go into the? They had all the green, uh, the green rock display, and they have an Antarctica display, and yeah, they have yeah, original, yeah. and they have the meteor meteorites in there as well. And honestly, I I just actually lose it now when I see a, see things like that, and it's all thanks to you guys. <laughs> so thanks for that. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. We've got. We remember the earth is made of rocks, so we better get to it and get to know them a bit better than we have because the whole place is made of this. Oh, yeah. And they're, they're aware of what we're doing. Yeah. It's, um, so I imagine you've lot, you've hit a lot of scepticism from traditional archaeologists overseas. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure the Australian ones are pretty much used to you guys now. Um, re your belief that original life began here in Australia. Um, and I know that there was a magazine that actually um, promoted it when you first um, started discussing it a few years ago, and that it was on the it was on the Scientist, wasn't it? New Scientist or something? And they actually said, "Cosmos, yeah, was yeah, yeah." There was a scientific yeah. paper, yeah, yeah. And they basically they all had a heart attack over there and um, started denying it and or whatever, and. How how is it now with the overseas these people that have read written their own books on it and been disproved basically? Um, is are you just generally ignored or is there is it improved overseas as well? You know, even though no, overseas we're, we're getting reactions in America and, and India and places like that, and they they are listening in Australia. No, no, it's going to be much harder there. We think. We're in the process of breaking through that. That's one of the things that we're working on a daily basis. Um, but no, no, Australia is, is, is awful. But oh, okay. um, we're, we're yeah. at the stage now where I think we're going to get through that. We actually thought we we're going to break through in another country, which we can't talk about because of the opportunities there. But mm -hmm. it seems like by the time the year's out, we might get through Australia and then get to these other countries and follow through. I, I do discuss the resistance. Um, uh, against us in uh, the latest book, actually. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Self indulgent like that. Yeah, so. we did get in. Evan gets indulgent and complains about the fact we get all these trolls and stuff. And, and, and try to account for why, you know, because yeah. my background's mm. psychology and well, stuff yeah. like that. I, I, I like to kind of work out why things are the way mm. they are. So, um, yeah, but we're right now, no, look, um, we're, we're at a stage at the moment now where. We're so used to them fighting and, and calling us names and stuff. It actually doesn't make any difference to us. It doesn't matter what they say and what they've done. Mm. They've already done. They've done everything yeah. they can. There's nothing left. So we don't care anymore. So I don't take much notice, to be honest. Although and I haven't run Christmas yet. Christmas could be next. Christmas? Uh, yeah, well, I ruined Australia Day. Oh, that's right. So well, that's your, I could run that's Christmas your problem, so mate. I, I don't deal with that. You're the ones destroying mainstream with your horrible theories. I, I'm not even <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Evan the uh, destroyer, hey? So, oh, it's yeah. got a bit of spring to it, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you had, uh, just have a think about this next one, this next question. Yeah. What is the most important lesson you both have learned from your work with the past? Just have a ponder. Yeah, that's an easy question, really, because the answer for me is pretty straightforward. Both Evan and I, we've met elders that maintain a tradition or way of living that I actually thought was lost. When I speak about these diff different people doing this sort of stuff, it became obvious to me that that's actually what humans are. So what we've learned from this is we've seen it in the archaeology, but we've seen it with humans that 
do things that we would call, a scientist would call magic. And I'm a scientist. We do, I do this pragmatically. I try and make this as empirical as I can. But I'm at the stage now, now where I don't doubt for a second that all of these stories about what the original people did telepathically, telekinesis, and all these things that we hear about are actually what every human on this planet is capable of doing. And that, to me, is the greatest travesty on this planet, that we aren't fulfilling our destiny. And I think that's what disappoints so many of our visitors from afar. What we've learned is this planet is unusual and special. I've been told more than once the trees grow on very, very few planets. They are special and sacred where trees grow, and we have the most diverse set of trees anywhere in the cosmos. That's what we've learned about this place. It's special. It's the first amongst equals, and we're trashing the place, and we've done it before, and this is the last time this will happen. And I suppose the most important part of this story is the archaeology we look at is always circular. For example, the skull that we have that has no forehead, that doesn't come from here, the spirit in that skull is still there to this day. We haven't got the time to talk about how we know this, but Ed Evan and I both know this back to front, and we know it in a personal level, that spirit, that skull came hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago as waited for the days we're speaking of now. And it came to fulfill a, a, a task that it couldn't fulfill at the time, which was to put this planet the way it should be and the beings on it to behave as they should. That's what we've learned is taking place. All we are, very simply, are puppets. And this, we, we've said this many times, haven't we? Yeah. We get shocked by what's going on. We are told to do these things and we don't know what comes the next day. We never studied skulls and this sort of stuff. It just turned up one day and then we had to burn up on it. Yeah, that's, that's usually how it part. goes. Shocking part. Oh, yeah. that's what I did. <laughs> but so, look, that's what we've learned. That it's not homo sapiens sapien. It's homo spiritual. This is the skill we have, that we can contact the divine and we have that ability and we've lost it. And what's coming back, what we've seen, and we know what we had in the past, what is still here and will come again, is that knowledge and wisdom. But I can say that I, I'm nearly 100% convinced the change will take place, but everyone needs to understand we have to make that change before the change that we can all see comes to fruition. We've got to do it first. I, I think it's amazing how... Um... Every, like people like ourselves, we we're all getting these messages and getting these feelings about this. And it's all the same. It's the same message we're all receiving, but we're receiving them from different areas. Um, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. But it, as I said, even even me, who I thought, you know, a few years ago, yeah. ask Sheila, she'll tell you. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually the devil's advocate and you know but I've done a complete about face on so many things um yeah I'm spending a lot of time trying to convince others at this point that they need to take a hard look at you know um pretty much biblical things and if you I I mean I never saw myself in that role but um it's happening and if that can happen to somebody like me who's always prided themselves on looking at things outside of a bias, um, it can happen to anyone. Okay. Now, we do have a chat question, guys. Is there a link between Adam's circle and Adam's calendar in South Africa? Do you, is that something you, know, you would be able to talk on? Well, we did spend a lot of time with Michael Tallinger. Um, we will Michael say it, yes. Are you aware of his work? <laughs> yes, there is. Absolutely. He's such global. a big guy. <laughs> and I love his, um, what did he call those circle things? There's like 180,000 of them in, in yeah. South Africa alone. Yeah, and they're, yeah. I think they're generators, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, electrical generators. That, uh, yeah, they are. It's right. And he's, he's spot on with what he's done. His research, is, we've, we've looked at it. He's, he's on the same story. We're all talking about the same thing. These rocks can be put in certain ways. 
Uh, Michael Challenger's rocks turned off a security system some in another airport, uh, didn't they? Yeah, his artifacts turned it off and they were pointing like machine guns at him and yeah, yeah, they got bailed up and taken out the plane and the uh, gun rushed the at his head. Yeah, look, we're on the same story. We're doing the same stuff. Remember the Brosses Rock one? The first time I saw it, Michael stood next to me and we saw it together. We discussed the power of rocks and the silicons, and we've got silicons that sing at different notes and if he's got them too. Yeah, look, it's the same story, guys, because it's a global story that was all over the planet and it needs to be a global story again where we all work on the same thing and that's all spiritual stuff and that's what Michael's on about. We're doing the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Michael's got it right and he knows what he's doing in Africa and we've got it right and we've got a bit of an idea what we know we're doing in Australia. Mm post that quantum entanglement thing inside the chat and inside our area guys so you can go check it out later um which it's it's all frequency based now that uh, since you just raised the frequency issue again now I, I i saw a wonderful documentary with michael tellinger when he was explaining um how wrong the archaeologists the the british archaeologists in in South Africa had got it so wrong that they thought they were all cattle, they were cattle corrals. But yes, they did, yeah, it's right. cattle it, yeah. But there was no actual way of getting yeah. them in and out. So what that does, it keeps the cattle in there so the lions can jump in there and climb over the walls and get them. Yeah. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous story on the planet. But yeah, that's right. But but that's hey, we've all got to deal with that because these guys went to another civilization that had a spiritual component and they didn't get any of it again. Same thing. It happened all over the world. These guys didn't get it when they turned up. Doesn't change. Michael's dealing with the same things we are in a different place. Yes. But he's he's a wonderful orator. I think I've heard him speak about five times now in uh, twice live and uh, a few times online and in interview format. And um, yeah, I just, I just, he, the size of what he's dealing with usually blows me away because he's not just dealing with like one site, he's dealing with a hundred, I think he basically, he said he went up in the air and they started to count how many of these corrals, is, is that, I think that's what he was telling them. What did it's you like say? counting sand on a beach. Yeah, just amazing. And he, he basically, they gave up after uh, they'd counted 180,000 and they, yeah. they weren't even like, a, a, you know, a, an eighth of the way through South Africa. And I mean, seriously, you, you've got to start wondering what were these things used for? And, um, and, and then I remember another one who was demonstrating how a certain type of rock when tapped inside a, a, a cone shaped kind of rock building, yeah. Created the levitation device, you know, yeah, actually rock, levitation. Rock, yeah. mm. and all done yeah. through frequency again. Just amazing, mm -hmm. amazing stuff. And that's a healing chamber. Um, and the same with the the pyramids; they're healing chambers, apparently. And yeah. uh, you know, and, and again, that's all through the frequency that's channeled through the uh, the actual py the pyramids themselves. So there's yeah, there's so much that really hasn't been explained to the mainstream and um, or hasn't well if it has been investigated that knowledge hasn't been shared which i think is just criminal just criminal it's, it's just, you're right about that mm. but fortunately we have um in australia we have the aboriginal people who do share a lot of them do a lot of them do some it, don't yeah, it's it's wonderful they've had that word of mouth passed down from generation to generation. Um, yep. And in a way, by, by keeping themselves to themselves throughout generations, they've been able to maintain that knowledge and it's not been diluted, which um, mm -hmm. which you usually find in other races is gone um, overnight. So... Yeah, well very much important, very important when original people are given ceremony, they memorize the ceremony word for word. And when they paint, there's always someone who guides them to tell them where everything goes. There's a rule about that. And to lie about your history and your past would be the greatest sin there could be. So the important part of, about original or oral history, unlike books, I know it's a 
you taught the other way around, because the word was oh, looked after so carefully, and most original people had no word for lying, then you have a true history because until 1770, no one had invaded anyone's property or territory in Australia ever. You mm. could have wars, but you could never come back and take their territory. You could never walk on their territory. You have your war in a, another place, and then you do that, then you go back home, and you can't walk on their place because the spirits don't know you and will kill you. So